Alright, you guys, looks like the stream didn't start when I intended it to. Um, I thought I had had it start, but apparently it did not, so we're a bit behind now. Unfortunately, because of that. So let's see here. We are queuing up for Heidi Christensen at uh, 2 o'clock, so we're about a half hour behind schedule. That's not that bad. Uh, we'll just go ahead and start that, and uh, so we'll be a little bit longer today. But enjoy, we have some great talks. Hi, uh, I'm Heidi, Heidi Christensen, Christensen from the Genius Paradigm. And I'm here to talk to you about helping your child find their genius. So to start out with, take a moment and just imagine something. A fairy flits around your home, darting in and out of your life, giving you ideas and direction, hoping you're smart enough to listen. If you aren't, away she goes. This was the Greek and Roman view of genius. A person wasn't a genius. They had the genius. They thought of it as a house god. You could listen or not, but everyone had one. In her book, Big Magic, Elizabeth Gilbert talks about the difference between being a genius and having a genius and how this small differentiation can have a huge difference on how we view ourselves and our gifts. If we are a genius, it's all on us. We have the responsibility, praise, big ego, etc. If it's something outside ourselves, it's a gift that we should be thankful to have. It's amazing how much our view of genius has changed. Today you say the word and immediately people think of like Einstein and Edison. But think about how these guys defined it. Years ago, I was at a conference, and there was a girl wearing a shirt with a quote on it. And I had to practically stalk her to uh, get the whole quote written down. You know, this was before smartphones, so it um, kind of tells you how long I've been at this homeschool thing. So anyway, it's attributed to Einstein, and this quote changed my life. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Too often we put labels on people and try to put them in boxes. We're judging the fish by how it can climb a tree. As an educator, I've seen so many students negatively impacted by this. Students valiantly try and climb the tree that just isn't meant to be climbed by them while not taking the time to jump in the river to show their true ability. I specialize in individualized education, and I attract students from both ends of the spectrum. I have students who are the fish out of water, as well as the students that are bored to tears because they keep being held back so that they don't get ahead of their peers in the classroom. Both need inspiration. The former needs help finding their genius. They feel stupid and have given up. But the bored student may be at the point of giving up too. Today's predominant educational system is one in which there are certain topics that must be learned in a certain way in order to be considered educated. If you don't do well in these topics, you're seen, to say it nicely, as lacking something. I'd like to challenge you to look at the world differently, but specifically at the educational system today. Let's shift our paradigm to the genius paradigm. Just think about how this could change the world. Or how about your world, your child's world? I think it would be pretty amazing. So let's start by changing your world and your child's. I've heard throughout my life that we each have a mission or purpose. And some people will liken my definition of genius to one of these. I've taught the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's classic deconstruction of almost every story ever told. and. I've also taught how to apply it to your own life. I've seen the power of teaching this and believing it, but I've also seen its problems. It's powerful to be able to teach a student that they have a purpose in life. There's a reason for them being here on earth right now. I have seen how, it, how even an unknown why helps students in times of difficulty and self-doubt, but it leaves many students confused. 
kids today are often depicted as entitled or lacking work ethic, but that just isn't true. Research shows that recent generations of young people perceive that others are more demanding of them, they're more demanding of others, and they're more demanding of themselves. Many of them are perfectionists. When you add the idea of mission to an already burdened student suffering from perfectionism, it may be too much. Perfectionism is not a good thing. It's stifling. You can't accomplish anything because it may not be perfect. It manifests itself as depression or anxiety. Mission and purpose are wonderful words, but they tend to be understood as being singular. You have a mission. What happens when you complete it? Is your life's work done? No. I've taught this over and over. Even the Campbell's journey alludes to it. When a mission is done, you get another one. And you go again. But sometimes it can just seem overwhelming. I've actually seen people give up and decide to go the easy route, the life of mediocrity. Maybe with a slight vocabulary change, we can eliminate this problem. In Donald Miller's book, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years, he talks about his story. He thinks of himself as the main character, and he gets to write the story of his life. And he wants a better story. A more powerful and more kid-friendly book that illustrates this is The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. The term he uses is personal legend. Vocabulary is really important. It either brings you in or it can make you feel excluded. Young people often can't see themselves as having a mission or being a hero, but they can insert themselves into a legend, especially with the story that Quello tells. The Alchemist is a story of a boy who's a shepherd. And this shepherd has a dream that's telling him to go on a journey to find a treasure. It's a journey that he's reluctant reluctant to go on until a man shows up and tells him about personal legends. This man gives him initial encouragement, and the memory of this guy serves to motivate the shepherd throughout the journey, especially when he's giving up. He thinks about turning back several times for several reasons. Losing everything for love, because of fear. But he wants to live his personal legend. And he knows that there's power in staying on course, even when it's hard. So, what story do you want to write for your life? What legend do you want to live? How about your kids? Do you want them to be the protagonist in their own story? Or a minor player in someone else's? As a protagonist, they'll be living and sharing their genius. They will be listening to those little fairies flitting in and out of their lives and putting their ideas into action. 21 years ago, when my oldest son turned five, I had a decision to make. I had to look at the educational system available for my kids, and I found it sadly lacking. I ended up homeschooling my kids, my five sons, for that reason. But now, I'm really in the thick of it. I've got my teaching credential, and I'm being confronted by the system in another way. I no longer just have five kids I'm responsible for. I have a whole roster of kids. And I'm seeing the results of the traditional educational system, and I want to do what I can to change it. Because I know there's another way that's so much better. I've been in the place where I had to change how I saw things. I had been homeschooling successfully for several years. I had a regular routine where my three older sons would sit down and we'd follow our classically inspired schedule. And then our fourth son turned five and insisted on starting school, even though his birthday is in January. He forced me to get off course. Have you been in a situation that forced you to reevaluate what you're doing and how you're doing it? It's hard. You're forced into something unfamiliar. It makes sense that you would fight change. Familiarity gives comfort, but it also limits growth. 
at that point in my homeschooling journey, I didn't have a desire for growth. I had just a few years before radically changed my ideas of how my children would be educated. I hadn't grown up knowing I would homeschool my kids. Only weirdos did something so radical, and that just wasn't me until it was. When our oldest son turned five and was ready to go to kindergarten, I did what I always thought I would do and went to sign him up. The first thing I had to fill out was a questionnaire. The first question was, was your child born vaginally or by C-section? If vaginally, were forceps used? Well, I couldn't go any further. My first thought was, really? And then, that is none of your business. Anyway, I did a little research on the school and the district. And the district was at the bottom of, a, of the state. The state, the school was considered to be failing. And I decided I just wasn't willing to sacrifice my kids' education to help them fix a failing system. They were trying to figure out what was wrong with the kids before they even started at the school. And I just knew I couldn't send my beautiful, sensitive son to a school that wanted to label him before he even started. So that prompted my first major paradigm shift in regard to education. I signed him up for private kindergarten that day and started talking to a distant relative that I had heard was homeschooling. I took two years to study and figure out how I could do it and started when our twins started uh, kindergarten. Little, little did I know how many more paradigm shifts were ahead of me. Stephen Covey, in his book, The Seven Habit, Habits of Highly Effective People, was my first introduction to the idea of paradigms. He states, paradigms are powerful because they create the lens through which we see the world. How did I see the world of education the day before I went to sign my oldest up for kindergarten? I didn't question it. I fully accepted it. It took a slap in the face to get me to look at something different. So, back to my son. My fourth son was nothing like his older brothers. He needed me to find a new way to teach him. Uh, I needed to inspire him. I was faced with continuing to see the world through the lens of my current systems of education and organization, or I could shift my paradigm. I had a decision to make. Right around this time, I was given the opportunity to attend a seminar about leadership education. Leadership education was popularized by Oliver DeMille's book, Thomas Jefferson Education. Before the seminar, I was asked to read the book so I could participate in a book discussion. So one paragraph stood out to me. Greatness is not the work of a few geniuses. It's the purpose of each of us. It's why we were born. Every person you have ever met is a genius. Every one. Some of us have chosen not to develop it. But it is there. It is in us. All of us. It's in your spouse. It is in each of your children. You live in a world of geniuses. How can we settle for anything less than the best education? How can we tell our children that mediocre education will do when greatness is available? So, how could I force my son into a mold he didn't fit into? I couldn't. I had to change my paradigm and see his genius. And that's what I'm advocating for you to do. Change your paradigm. When I started homeschooling, I basically did school at home. I had my kids work through curriculum and take tests and kept going because what else was I supposed to do? That was the way to do it, right? But soon I figured out how stupid it was for me to remove my kids forward when they didn't understand a concept. I had the freedom to take the time to individualize my kids' education. So I did. If they needed more time, I gave it to them. If a certain curriculum wasn't working, I changed it. If they wanted to show me how they learned or what they learned in a different way, I let them. Do this but also more. Encourage them to write their own story. Be the protagonist. Live their genius. This may mean they need to stray from the beaten path. 
They might need time to really dive deep into subjects that might not be on the list of things they are supposed to be studying at their age. Let them do it anyway. Help them find and listen to that fairy flitting around in their thoughts, telling them all about their genius. Accept a genius paradigm for yourself and help them develop theirs. If you'd like to learn more about different characteristics to develop to help you and your child live your genius, check out my other presentation. If you have any questions, you can contact me here. Thank you and have a great day. Hi, welcome. This is Right Start Math, Why It Works. My name is Teresa Fulton, and all of this information is based on the work of Dr. Joan Cotter. So Right Start Math is a hands-on, um, manipulative, and card game-based program. We also use a linear fraction chart, which we'll talk about later. The question you always want to ask yourself when you're choosing a curriculum is, who is the author? What gives her the right to tell me how to teach this particular subject. So let's take a look at Dr. Cotter and what her background is. She is an engineer from the University of Wisconsin, so she knows how math works in the real world. She's also a Montessori educator. She, she is very familiar with um, children and how their brains work. Putting the two together is a fabulous combination. She's also the math card games author, and this came about um, because of a personal issue that she had with her family. Her son, Andy, was um, struggling in school. He was in third grade, and he was really having trouble with math. He had a lot of math anxiety. She pulled him from that school and put him into what would now be called a charter school, and she had to put in volunteer hours. So her volunteer hours consisted of playing card games with the kids to help them with their math facts. This worked so well, not only for Andy, but also for all of the kids in the school, that the teachers and the parents really encouraged her to publish these math card games. And so that was how the math card games came about. She also became a special needs teacher. And from that developed the activities for learning abacus. Then she became a middle school teacher. I believe it was in an inner city school. She was dealing with seventh graders and she discovered that she needed to teach, take them back to first grade math in order to fill in all the gaps that they had acquired over those seven years. This convinced her that our math education in the US is just a disaster. And so in order to do something about that, she went back and got her PhD in math education from the University of Minnesota with an emphasis in brain research. All right, let's look at the abacus. This is um, specially designed by Dr. Cotter. It's called the Activities for Learning Abacus. We have 10 rows of beads, 10 beads each. So we have 100 total. They're divided in color after five and after 50. And we'll take a look at why that's important later. Ginsburg and other researchers have said that the role of a physical manipulative is to help the child form visual images and thus eliminate the need for the physical manipulatives. The abacus really stands out as a supreme manipulative given that definition. It is visual and tactile. It develops mental images of quantities, strategies, and mathematical operations. Now this is an interesting quote. Ben Pridmore was the world memory champion of 2009. And he said, think in pictures because the brain remembers images better than it does anything else. And we all know that to be true. Otherwise, the advertising industry would not work as well as it does. So how can we help kids think in pictures about math? Let's look at subitizing. Subitizing is the quick recognition of a quantity without counting. So tell me how many fingers you see here. It's three, right? Did you have to count it? No, not at all. You saw right away. That is subitizing. That's the quick recognition of a quantity without counting. How about this time? Do you see seven? Did you have to count them? No. 
All right, so here's a little test for you. Try to visualize eight apples in a row lined up on your counter. No grouping. Can you picture those eight apples? It's pretty difficult to do. This is what it would look like if you could do it. Now, try to visualize five as red and three as green. Is that a little bit easier? It should be. That's what that would look like. So grouping by fives is really helpful. And we do it everywhere. When we're telling time, counting money, and even the early Romans grouped by fives. So this has been around for a long time. We need grouping in order to visualize quantities. Take a look at this rod. Can you tell how many divisions there are there without counting? It's not grouped by fives, so it's really hard to see the quantity. Lucky for us, our hands are already grouped by fives, so that's a nice little tool. And because of that, the abacus is also grouped in fives. Now, let's say I'm just starting off with a youngster. It doesn't really matter how old the child is. We want to make sure that they can subitize. So I will ask, can you show me three? And they'll hold up three fingers. And then I'll say, great, can you enter three? Now, I want them to enter those three beads all at once in one um, complete movement, not counting individual beads, one, two, three. If they do count, then I would just go to the next line and give the three a nudge and say, can you enter the three beads now? And then the next line, the third line, say, okay, can you do it without me touching? And they should be able to do that for sure. So once they get the idea that they should not count the beads, then it'll be very easy for them to subitize and move those beads all at once. Once they've done that, you can show them the numeral three. Let's try it again. Show me five, enter five. Here's the numeral five. Show me seven, enter seven. Here's the numeral seven. Show me 10, all 10 fingers, all 10 beads. Here is the numeral 10. Now, you've noticed we haven't been counting those beads. We've just been supervising them and entering them as a group. The next activity you could do is to have the kids build the stairs. Now this is counting because I would have them say, once they've built the stairs, I'd have them read out the number, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So that is counting, but it's counting with meaning because they're looking at the quantity while they're saying the name of the number. It's not just a, a sequence of words thrown together. Okay, let's look at using the abacus for adding. Here we have four plus three, that's our equation. So I'm going to enter four on the abacus and partially enter three. And I'll say four plus three equals, and I push them together. The quantity can be seen immediately. You've already seen this, this amount represented while we were talking about subitizing. That is seven, we don't have to count it. Now compare that to a typical work, worksheet. Are you able to subitize that? The quit quantity is not quickly recognizable. All right, another thing that we can do, a very important thing to do, is to teach the kids what makes 10. So we can use the abacus for this. Enter one, see what's left over on that top line. It's nine, so one plus nine, two plus eight, three plus seven, four plus six, and so on, until you get all the way back to nine plus one. Once you've introduced what makes 10, you're gonna to wanna to reinforce those concepts with games for practice. One real simple game and a very fun one that the kids love to play is called Go to the Dump. It's a go fish type of game where the pairs are one and nine, two and eight, whatever makes 10, three and seven, and so forth. You just need the basic number cards, one through nine, and an abacus. In the beginning, they're going to be checking to make sure that they're asking for the right amount. And that's good. Eventually, they won't need the abacus to play the game. There's also an app for your devices, phones or iPads. Um, it's called Go to 10. And you may be wondering, okay, other than it being fun, why is it that we're encouraging you to play math card games? 
And the reason for that is that games are to math as books are to reading. Just like you wouldn't use worksheets to teach your child how to read, you'd give them interesting books, right? The same thing applies for math. Let's give them interesting games to apply that math. Games provide the interesting repetition needed for automatic responses, and the plus is it's in a social setting. More importantly, games provide an application for the new information. The kids want to know what they're learning because they want to win. All right. Place value is an interesting um, problem for many students, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be readily solved in the general population. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. The author of Trevisio Arithmetic of 1478, that was written over 500 years ago, considered place value so important that it was listed first among the five operations of arithmetic. I always thought there was only four, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But this author says, nope, place value is even more important because without it, you can't do the other operations. Place value organizes numbers into neat little packets. And without it, computational algorithms make little sense. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So children often think of 14 as 14 ones and not a 10 and four ones. The pattern that's needed to make sense of those tens and ones is hidden in the English language. All right, how do we solve that problem? If they can't make sense of the tens and ones, let's use the abacus. Here I'll enter 10 on the first line and 10 on the second line. Can you tell me how many beads I've entered? Now, you may have said 20, and of course you're correct, but bear with me, for a little while, we're gonna be calling that 210. This would be, what do you think? Yes, 2104, good, okay. So 2104, now we have 2108, good. And of course, this is 310. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story about this. My son was six years old when I first started teaching him um, as a homeschooler. And I asked him to write the number 13 and he wrote 31. Well, obviously he didn't have a clue what the difference was between 13 and 31. And the reason why he wrote 31 is because he heard the three first. So he thought he should write that number first. Um, once I introduced him to Write Start, I showed him on the abacus one time, just one time, the difference between 10, three and three, 10, one. And he got it. He never made that mistake again. And that was really valuable for him. He's dyslexic. And so it was very natural for him to confuse the numbers and flip them around. But the transparent place value, the transparent way of naming numbers really helped him understand the quantity. Okay. So there we had 310. This is 3106. And how does this work? All right, 10 is obviously 10. 11 is 10, 1. 12 is 10, 2. 20 is 210. 21 is 210, 1. 210, 2. 210, 3. All the way to 910, 9. Now, you might be wondering why are we teaching the kids to name their numbers this way? How is this helpful? Well, we use it for two reasons. One, patterning. We say 3 million, we say 3,000, we say 300. Why don't we say 310? Remember, math is all about patterns. So let's stick with the pattern to make life easier for everybody, right? The other reason is place value. All right, so here I will tell the student to enter 310. They enter 310 and I bring out a place value card. I'm gonna to point to the three and say three and to the zero and say 10. So I've just identified the written numerals, the three and the zero as 310. Now we're gonna do 310 seven. Slide the seven on top of the zero. We have 310 seven. Enter 610. Here's the 610 place value card. Now enter 610 two. Slide the two over on top of the zero and we have 610 two. If you enter all the beads, we have 10, 10, 10, 10, or we also call it 100. Now you can use the syllables in the words to help the kids identify what it is. So I would point to the three in the 30 and say 310. 
than 300, 3,000. That's a bit of a stretch, but you don't have to do it for very long. Now, when you and I were taught place value, we learned to build from right to left, ones, tens, hundreds, thousands. And then we had to reverse it and read it from left to right. Now, that can cause a lot of issues for kids, especially if they have a bit of dyslexia. So, with the transparent number naming, we're going to build these numbers with place value cards from left to right, exactly the way we read it. So here we have 3,600, 5,108. Now, if I get all the way to the right side here and my student can't remember what the six is, they can just peel off the cards and say, oh, yeah, that's right, it's 600. Okay. So just like reciting the alphabet doesn't teach reading, you know, if your child can sing the alphabet song, that doesn't mean that he or she knows how to read, right? Well, being able to count to 100 doesn't mean that they understand arithmetic. And just as we first teach the sound of letters, we must first teach the name of the quantity. This is the math way of naming numbers or the transparent number naming system. Interestingly, children in Asia learn mathematics using the math way of number naming. And they understand place value in first grade. Only half of US children understand place value at the end of fourth grade. So why is that? Well, remember, mathematics is the science of patterns. And the patterned math way of number naming greatly helps children learn number sense. So let's take a look at a little bit of research that was done. There were two groups of kids divided. One group had been taught the math way of naming numbers, and the other group had been taught just the traditional way of naming numbers. They were asked to use 10 rods and individual one pieces. They were like the, um, you know, the blocks that just stick together. They uh, were told to build 48. And they did so. Both groups did fine. No problem. However, they were asked to then subtract 14. So the group that had been taught the traditional way of naming numbers subtracted 14 individual blocks. And those who counted well got the right answer, but not everybody in that group got the right answer because they made mistakes in counting. The second group that had been taught the math way of naming numbers or the transparent number naming system, they removed one 10 rod and four individual ones. Every single student in that group got the right answer, including a young boy who had been born prematurely, he had had a lot of learning disabilities and other is health issues that really hindered his learning, yet he was perfectly capable of doing this problem. So that's just a simple example of how learning the math way of naming numbers helps the kids understand number sense. Now, you may be wondering, okay, how long are they going to walk around talking like this because it's a little embarrassing when grandma's looking at me going, hmm, they don't even know their numbers right. We introduce those traditional names in one easy lesson. So here I'd have the students enter 410, and I'd say, how much is this? And they'd say 410. Okay. Did you know that 10 can also be said T? It can. So 410 becomes 40. Very simple. All right, 810 becomes 80. And now let's look at the teens. That will also take one lesson, but we're going to do it separately from the tens that we were already working on. And first, we're going to play a word game with the kids. I'm going to say the, name, the word fireplace, and you will say the reverse of that. Place fire, okay? Newspaper, you would say paper news, good. Box mail, mailbox, excellent. All right, now I'm going to ask the kids to enter 10 4. Did you know that another way to say 10 is teen? Teen 4 becomes 14. That's not hard, is it? All right. Let's try another one. Enter 10, 8. Then we have teen 8, 18. All right. Now you may be wondering, what do we do about 11 and 12? Have you noticed that 11 and 12 give you absolutely no clue as to how much that quantity is? There's a reason for that. All right. 11, the word 11 came about 
back in the Middle Ages, the people were looking at this number and said, what are we going to call that? And they said, oh, well, it's a one left over from the 10. So let's call it a one left. That flipped to a left one. And that slurred into the word 11. Now, 12 has a similar background. Back in the Middle Ages, the W was pronounced. So it was two left and two left became 12. True story. All right. The next thing that we're going to talk about is strategies. So what is a strategy? It's a way to learn a new fact or recall a forgotten one. And a visual representation is a powerful strategy. So let's use our visual representation with the abacus. The first strategy we're going to learn is the complete the 10 strategy. I'll enter nine on the top line and five on the next. And then I'm going to identify the beads that I'm going to trade to complete the 10 on that top row. So when you see that red circle, that's the child's finger touching that bead and this one. And we're going to trade. So I'll say, okay, one, two, three, trade. And they trade and they can see their answer right away. Their answer is 14 or 10, four. Let's try it again. Nine plus seven. Enter nine on the top line seven on the next. Identify the beads that are going to trade. And we have 16 or 10, six. Now the next strategy that we're going to talk about is the two fives strategy. I'll enter eight on the top line and six on the next. Can you see right away that there's two fives? So if I have two fives, I know I have 10 and what's left over is four. So I have 10, four or 14. How about seven plus five? Enter seven on the top line, five on the next. Identify the two fives, there's my 10. I have two left over, my answer is 10, two or 12. We can also do this with subtraction. The three strategies we're gonna talk about today are part from 10, all from 10 and going up. All right, here's our equation, 15 minus nine. I'm going to enter 15. And then I'm going to subtract, this is the part from 10 strategy, I'm going to subtract 5 and then 4. And my answer is 6. Didn't even have to count it, did you? All right, let's do that again. Enter 15. And now I'm going to take all from the 10. So I'm going to subtract 9 from the top line. And I'm still left with 6. Now this may surprise some of your students, but it's a good kind of surprise. They have just learned that Oh my goodness, we can solve problems in different ways. And that is very helpful, both with math and just in general life problems. There's more than one way to solve a problem. Okay, so the next one, the last strategy for subtraction that I'm gonna talk about is going up. Instead of starting with 15, I'm just gonna start with nine and move up to 15. How many do I have to enter? Six. So all three strategies got me the right answer, and that answer in this case is six. Now you may be wondering, why in the world do my kids need to learn strategies? Why can't they just memorize their facts? Well, several good reasons for learning strategies, but the one that comes to mind right now is the fact that we can use these strategies in different circumstances based on those circumstances. So for example, when would you use the going up strategy? Can you guys think of an example? Well, I know one. Let's say I went to the convenience store and I wanted to buy a pack of gum and it was 89 cents. <clears throat> and I wanted to know how much change I was gonna get back. I give the do a dollar to the clerk and I'm not gonna sit there and go, okay, a dollar minus 89 cents, borrow, borrow. Oh, what was that? I don't remember. No, I'm gonna say 89 cents plus a penny is 90 cents plus a dime is a dollar. So I'm getting back 11 cents change. Very good example of how in that case, I wanna use this different kind of strategy. You also may wonder, okay, well, just memorizing the facts. Well, in that case, memorizing the facts wouldn't have helped me, right? Also, what if you forgot your facts? You need a strategy to figure out what the answer really is. So those are two good reasons to use strategies. <clears throat> All right, if we flip the abacus over to the second side, you'll see that there are place values marked there. Cleared is when the beads are down and we have the thousands column 
there's two wires to each of these, thousands, hundreds, tens, and ones. Let's start with this problem, eight plus six. I'm going to enter eight beads. Notice how I'm keeping the beads even. This will help me know when I've passed 10 and need to trade. So eight, now I'm gonna enter six. And before I get it all the way entered, I'm going to stop and check and make sure. Do I have six? Yes, I do. Okay, go ahead and enter it all the way. And do I need to trade? Yes, I do, because I have more than 10 in that one column. So I'm going to trade 10 ones. I'll trade 10 ones for one 10. And my answer is 14. Now I didn't have to trade in order to get that answer. I could see it right away. So I'll back up here a sec. I could see that my answer was 14 even before trading, but we know we have to carry that one. So we're gonna trade those 10 ones and enter one 10. So we have one 10 four. Now you may wonder how do I know to remove, how do I know when I've removed 10 beads without counting? Well, if you notice there's four blue beads that are being removed, I want to mirror that on the top. That I'm leaving behind four yellow beads because I'm taking four blue beads. And then without counting, I know assuredly that I am removing 10. I am pushing 10 down and replacing that with one 10. All right. This can be expanded to four digit addition, for example. Here we'll enter 3,000, 600, 5, 10, 8. Now I'm going to start at the right and I'm going to enter eight ones. And I can see right away, I need to trade. So remember, I'll leave behind six yellow beads. I'll remove the 10 ones and I'll trade it for one 10. Check and make sure that I did it right. Yep, I did. I'm going to trade. And now I'm going to write down the answer. I have six beads in the ones. And because I traded, I will carry one as we added one to the tens column. Now we'll add three beads to the tens column. See how many we have there? There's just one missing from the tens, so we know it's nine. I didn't have to do any trading. Now I'm gonna add seven to the hundreds column. I do need to trade, subtract the 10. So trade 10 hundreds for 1,000. I write down my answer, I have three hundreds and I traded, so I'm gonna carry the one. Now I add 2,000 and my answer is 6,396. So this is a really good um, way of showing the kids why they need to carry that one. I know when I was in school, I was in second grade, I carried the one because Mrs. Earn asked me to carry the one. She told me that I needed to carry the one. I didn't carry the one because I understood that it was a group of, one, of 10 ones moving over to the tens column. And I think many people have had that experience. So most children who learn to add on the AL Abacus transition to paper and pencil algorithm without further instruction. So they already know what they're doing, why they need to carry the one, and, um, and they can move on. They don't have to be using their abacus you know, when they walk off to college. It is just used as a tool to get them the information that they need, and then they on their own will give up using it. So you don't ever have to worry about taking it away. All right, let's move on to multiplication. <clears throat> Here we have um, six entered twice, right? So I'm gonna say that's called six taken two times, or six times two. This is six taken three times, six taken four times. So what is the answer for six taken four times or six times four? Well, here we can use the two five strategy. We have 10, 20, and what's left over? Four. So we have 24 or two ten four. Here we have five times seven. Once again, two five strategy, we've got 10, 20, 30, five. Or once the kids have gotten to this point, they have been using the abacus for so long that they know that that blue quadrant up there is 25. So they can just start with 25 and add 10 to it. The answer is still 35. How about seven times seven? Here we have 25, another 10 is 35, another 10 is 45, plus four is 49. 
All right, let's try nine times three. So we could do the complete the 10 strategy. We could use that. We're gonna trade the beads until we've got them all moved over. There we go. Our answer is two, 10, seven. But another strategy is we could look at the whole picture and say, how much is 10 times three? And then subtract three. So 10 times three is 30, minus three is 27. How about nine times seven? Okay, nine times seven, let's say 10 times seven is 70, minus seven is 63. Now don't forget, Right Start Math uses these tools like the abacus and the fraction chart, which I'll show you in a little bit, to teach the concepts. And then we reinforce those concepts with the card games. We do have worksheets, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and those are mainly a check for understanding. By the time they get to their worksheets, unless it's an activity, um, they are just proving to you that they can get it on a piece of paper, that what they have in their brain can be transmitted to that paper. Okay, so games are really important for practicing their math facts. And they're far more enjoyable than doing page after page of, you know, 50 problems each. And more effective. Okay, so one game for multiplication that's really fun is called Ring Around the Products. So we take the product cards or the multiplication cards, we lay out six of them and surround them with the basic number cards, one through 10. Okay, shuffled up so it's random. All right, I'll go first and I'll look at the number 54 and I'll say to myself, okay, are there any numbers around the outside of that circle that when multiplied together equal 54? Can you guys see two numbers that when multiplied together equal 54? I do, I see the six and the nine, right? Okay, so I can take those cards. So I take the six, the nine, and the 54. Now I move on to the 12. Are there any numbers when multiplied together in the outer circle that equal 12? Sure enough, two times six. We could have also done three times four, but there wasn't a four available, right? Okay, so I would keep playing these blue cards. Um, once I take the two and the six and the 12, there's not gonna be a six available for the 42. So I normally it would be six times seven, but it's not available. So I just have to skip it. I move on to 50. Is there a five times 10? No, there's not. I move on to 15. Is there a three times five? Sure enough, I could take that. But once I take that three, I can't take the nine. So there's no three, three times three left, right? Okay, so then my turn would be over and the next person gets to go. We'd fill in those multiplication cards, we would fill in the basic number cards, and the next person's turn continues through all six of those blue cards, blue numbered cards. All right. Well, aside from multiplication facts and um, just getting kids to recognize quantities, fractions come up often as a big stumbling point for children. Now, Right Start Math uses a linear model chart. Um, this model is much more effective than the pie charts because you can make comparisons very easily. So we really encourage you to use the linear chart and you can start with kids as young as kindergarten teaching them about fractions so that by the time they're using it a lot in math, it's not um, scary anymore. They've, they're familiar with fractions, they're comfortable with them. So one easy way to introduce fractions is to start off like this. How many fourths are in a whole? If you don't know, you count them. Oh, there's four fourths in a whole. How many fifths are in a whole? Once again, you just count them, five fifths. How many eighths are in a whole? eight eighths. All right, once we know that, once we know what makes one, we can move on. Which is more, third, three fourths or four fifths? Well, let's just check. Here's three fourths and here is four fifths. The comparison is very easy to see. Four fifths is a little bit more. How about seven eighths or eight ninths? Ooh, eight ninths slides by just by a hair, but it is more. All right, once we can make those comparisons, let's move on to this. What is half of half? Now remember, you will have a whole fraction chart that's complete, and you'll have another one that's broken up into puzzle pieces. So these pieces are movable. So when you see me highlight something on here, 
you could actually be physically moving that piece to make comparisons. So what is half of a half? Well, here's the half. And when it's divided in half, the answer is one fourth. What is one third of one half? Once again, you can slide that half piece down, see where it's divided up into three, and you see that it's one sixth. That is multiplying fractions. And you didn't even have to talk about it. You didn't even say it was multiplying fractions. The kids are already multiplying fractions and it was really easy. Nobody cried. All right. Um, this mathematics educator from England, Cockcroft, said that the now well-established fact that those who are mathematically effective in daily life seldom make use in their heads of the standard written methods which are taught in the classroom. Well, that begs the question, why are we teaching those methods if they're not used by mathematically effective people, right? Why would we do that? Instead, shouldn't we be teaching the children to think like math-minded people already think? That is much more effective. Now, you probably had experiences, whether you were considered yourself a math-minded person or not. When you were in school, did you have the experience where you maybe weren't math minded and so you followed the rules you did exactly what the teacher did you could add in a line carry the one add the tens whatnot and the math minded people have figured out a, an easier strategy on their own right or you were the math minded person and wondering what is taking everybody so long it's because those people who were taking longer were following these ineffective standard written methods they weren't taught the quicker methods, the, the methods that are more effective for mental math. So really to do our students a favor, we need to be teaching them to think like math-minded people. All right, so how does Right Start Math work? We use the abacus to develop visualization, which you already saw is really important. It makes mental math so much faster. We teach topics in different ways with different approaches so that the kids can see how math is applied in real life. Fractions are presented in a linear format because comparisons are much easier on a frac linear fraction chart than in a pie chart. Games are the practice and review, so much more enjoyable than doing a lot of worksheets and far more effective. 15, 10 to 15 minutes of a game is equal to a worksheet. They're far more likely to play more games than to ask for more worksheets as well. And we use over 20 different well thought out manipulatives. These are not gimmicky manipulatives. They're not just go to your junk drawer and, and pick something. They're really well thought out manipulatives that can be used in multiple ways. So you'll have manipulatives and they will be very useful and you'll see that. And the books are arranged in levels rather than grades. This is to help those kids who maybe they have to start a couple of years back you know, maybe you have a fifth grader who needs to go to third grade math to actually fill in those holes. They're not going to have to stare at the big old three on the front of the cover. It'll have a letter on it instead, which will mean nothing. So that's really helpful for those kids who have to um, go back a few grades. Okay, how are the lessons set up? Every lesson is set up pretty much the same way. You always have your objectives and your materials. I really didn't ever do any prep using this program. I just would make sure that I gathered my materials. Now some people feel more comfortable reading the lesson the night before and I'd say that's the maximum that you have to do. The activities for teaching are on the left hand side of each page and those are very easy to follow. You just read them and you ask the, the student, your child, the questions. Um, and lucky for you, they have the answers in the book. So you didn't have to have your cup of coffee or maybe it didn't kick in yet. Okay, the other side of the page, the right-hand side, is an explanation. These are notes for you as the teacher. So maybe it will say, now's a good time to introduce such and such. Or it might say, don't tell them the algorithm, let them figure it out. Because you know when that light bulb goes off in your head, you never forget what you learned. But somebody could tell you time and time again an algorithm or some other fact, and you keep forgetting it. So we really want the kids to discover how math works. But these are just little notes for you. Sometimes there aren't any, and sometimes there are. All right. This program is an award-winning program. 
we have received awards from various organizations. Um, there's the Parents Seal of Approval, the Old Schoolhouse Excellence in Education, and the Learning Success Institute, which specializes in programs for children with learning issues. We're very happy to announce that we have won the Practical Homeschooling Award first place since 2014, and even the most recent in 2019. So Richard Skemp, a mathematics educator, says that math needs to be taught so that 95% is understood and only 5% memorized. What does he mean by that? Well, what he means is 5% memorized, they're talking about definitions, like what's a quadrilateral, what is a polygon, those kinds of things. The rest of it really does need to be understood. And that's our goal at Right Start, is that students come through our program and really understand how math works. Dr. Cotter says, our goal as teachers of mathematics is to help our children transform, expand, and refine these beginning ideas into deeper mathematical thinking. So she doesn't want you to be satisfied with just knowing the basics, but to actually be able to go beyond and to explore how math is surrounding us, right? Math is involved in more occupations than, than pretty much anything else. So it's very important that our students, in order to succeed, have a good understanding of math. So if you'd like to contact us, you could do so through our website, email, or phone. We always have people available to answer your questions, and these are people who are using the program and who really understand how it works. So I'd like to thank you for joining me for Right Start Math, Why It Works, and I hope that you have a great day. Thanks so much. All right, so that was Teresa Fulton from Right Start Mathematics, and I love Right Start Mathematics. I'm actually, as Money Munch Kids, we are partnered with them. Uh, we carry their Money Games set, Money Games kit, and it's just been a pleasure. I met Kathleen years ago, and or not years ago, was it a year ago? It might have been over a year ago, actually. Um, and anyway, I met her a long time ago, and we immediately hit it off, and I saw their Money Games set, and I was like, I need to have that. Uh, who do I have to talk to? And it turns out that uh, she was right there, and we got to talking, and we've been, been, you know, we talked back and forth for several months, and we we're like, we, we have to partner together. We just, you know, you, you see those people who have the passion for education, they have creative thinking about ways that they can help kids learn, and it's just, it's so inspiring. So I'm really glad that we were able to include Right Start Math. And again, I wanted to highlight just before we get into uh, the next session real quick, I know we're still playing catch up, but I did want to highlight that we are doing a money games kit giveaway. All you have to do, um, sorry, all you have to do is post a picture of any game, preferably your favorite game, um, on any social media platform, whether it be Facebook, um, Instagram, it could be on the, the DCH Facebook, it can just be on your fa Facebook, so long as you mark it as public and we can find that post and use the hashtag DCH2020, then we will be able to find it and we'll randomly pick a winner and they will get a money games kit from Right Start Math and you know we all, we just had game school, homeschool this morning, so we all really hammered that into our heads that playing is very is a very good tool for education so that I just want to remind everyone of that giveaway there and we're gonna go on to Leanne and this is how to use emotional uh, emotional intelligence to cope through a crisis from Leanne James from Melanin Tot and I uh, just want to say that just in case anyone's uh, playing catch up with us oops hold on here we go there we go all right. Hi, I'm so glad that you are able to join me today to learn about emotional intelligence and coping strategies for your families to get through crisis. I know right now we have a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world, but I'm going to tell you some different ways that you can cope as an individual and as a family. This is going to be particularly helpful for those who are homeschooling for the first time 
or those who are only homeschooling temporarily until they're able to go back to work full time and put your kids um, in an educational institution of your choice. All right, so the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is addressing your emotions. During hard times, it can be very challenging to identify exactly how you're feeling. It can be um, emotionally draining as we're going through social media. One second you're up and you're looking at something funny and you're laughing. The next second you're looking at how the pandemic is shaping the world and and taking people's lives. And so you can go to, from high highs to low lows very quickly. And this makes it very challenging to identify how you're feeling. And so one way that you can identify how you're feeling is by asking yourself the four questions. Now, please note that as a parent or guardian, it's really important that you're able to identify how you're feeling first before interacting with a child or challenging the way they're feeling because our children look to us for coping skills and coping mechanisms. Our voice becomes their inner voice. So it's very important that we are um, taking responsibility for our feelings and we cannot do that until we identify them. So we can identify our feelings using the four questions. The first question is simple, how am I feeling? Now this question is a question that really starts out the trajectory of the rest of the question. This is a question that clicks something in your subconscious mind to say, wait, I'm feeling something, and really gives you the, the reason to pause and be intentional about recognizing that you are feeling. It doesn't matter what you say your feeling is at this point, it's just the behavior of stopping and recognizing that you are feeling. So that's the first question. How am I feeling? The second question is, when did I start to feel this way? Now, this is a time where you recognize, okay, I went from one state of being to another state of being, and there was a shift that occurred. The second question allows you to stop and focus in on yourself so that you can pinpoint exactly when that shift occurred. The third question is, why does that make me feel this way? So after you've identified the shift, the next question is, well, why? Why did that thing change my state of being? Why did that thing shift my emotions from one state to another? And then the final question is, how am I feeling? I know it's the same question as the first, but this how am I feeling is more accurate. Let me give you an example. So I am a homeschool parent of four beautiful children. My kids are busy. They are eight, six, three, and eight months. So I was up all night long with the baby. I got up, I made the kids breakfast, and the first thing they do is complain. Oh, mom, I don't want this. I don't want oatmeal for breakfast. I don't like raisins in mine. Oh, God, did you put cinnamon in this? Oh, this is horrible. So they were just upset complaining about breakfast. I pull out their work for the day and I'm like, okay, you guys, try my best to get them engaged and nobody wants to do their work. This is boring, this is hard, I don't know how to do it and I'm just at my wit's end. I cannot believe that these kids are not being grateful. Don't they know how hard I work? So how am I feeling? I'm frustrated, I feel unappreciated, I'm, I'm a little discouraged, like these kids, man. When did you start to feel this way? Well, I was up all night with the baby. And so I didn't have very much energy and I'm going and giving everything I have, my last drops of energy, my last drops of sanity, I'm pouring out of these kids. Well, why? Why did that make you feel that way? Well, you know, I didn't have very much energy. So how are you feeling? I'm tired. See, my initial how am I feeling was frustration, right? I'm frustrated, the kids aren't doing what I want them to do, yada, yada, yada. But after I go through the steps, I realize that I'm not really frustrated, I'm tired. So here's the thing, when you are identifying your first emotion, you can't just stop there. I know it sounds simple to 
just be like, how am I feeling? Oh, okay, that sounds accurate. I'll go with that. But that's not always true. Let's look at what will happen if I treated my first, how are you feeling? If I treated my frustration, what would I have done? Maybe I would have called a friend or journaled. Um, perhaps I would have indulged in my favorite sweet treat or made myself, you know, a nice breakfast and really treated myself. But then shortly after, I would be tired again because I never treated my initial feeling. I never addressed how I was feeling and gave myself what I needed in order to rectify that frustration, right? Or that, that tiredness. And so now that I know, okay, I'm not frustrated, I'm actually tired, now I know what to do. Now I can phone a friend and say, hey, can you watch the kids for me for a little bit while I take a quick nap? Now I can give the kids an activity or put on a movie and go and sneak away and lay down for a little bit. But here's the thing, when you do not identify how you are feeling, then you don't know which coping mechanisms to use to feel the way that you are wanting to feel. Identifying your feelings also helps you um, identify and shape the things that you need in order to succeed. Here's the cool thing is you can actually use those, que those four questions in reverse to create the environment that you need in order to succeed. You can say, hmm, when I do something really good, like when I am accomplished, when I feel accomplished, when I feel purposeful, when I feel empowered, why do I feel that way? I feel that way because I've completed something. Okay, when do you feel that way? I feel that way when I get done doing a big, project. Okay, so how am I feeling? I'm feeling empowered, right? And so I can look at my situation and say, okay, what, what was I doing? Why did um, this success happen? And then use those things that I've discovered about myself to recreate an atmosphere for success. Some people work really, really well in loudness and in chaos. That's me. I'm the oldest of five. I thrive in energy, in energetic situations. I'm like, yes, let's do it. I feed off of the energy. I use it to fuel me. My husband is the exact opposite. He can work by a quiet beach and get a lot done. I would get distracted by the waves and the beauty of the sand and I would, I would engulf myself in it and wouldn't get much work done. But he, he would get work done because that's the environment he needs to succeed. So when you learn how to identify your feelings and identify them accurately, you can reverse engineer that process so that you are able to really set yourself up to succeed. Okay, so now that you've identified your feelings and now that you have skills to really hone in on how you're feeling so that you can respond to your true feelings, how do you do that with kids? Okay, so here's some ideas. The first thing that you should do with your kids is give them the vocabulary to express themselves. So teach them words outside of sad, happy, angry. You know, teach them frustrated. Teach them aggravated. Teach them somber. Teach them anxious. Teach them different words so that they can express how they're feeling and so that they can accurately express how they're feeling. It's important to also give them ways to cope. So one thing I like doing with my daughter, my three-year-old, is I like to create videos of her. And what I'll do is I'll take pictures when she's upset. I'll say, here, let's make a, a book together. And I'll sit her on my lap and she might be pouting or crying. I'll take some pictures of her and I'll let her see herself so it'll be in selfie mode. And we'll take some pictures and then well, I'll, we'll go through the process. I'll say, okay, take a deep breath. Breathe in, and she'll breathe in. I snap a picture, breathe out, snap a picture. And so we were able to just create these little storybooks featuring her. And I just used a simple app where I was able to compile the pictures in order. And then I did a voiceover track. And it was so simple, so easy, and so effective. Because what I did is I included her 
and, to, and a coping skill in order to help her with her emotions. And so when she gets frustrated, now she's able to look at her story and say, okay, I know what to do when I'm mad. I breathe in and I breathe out. And I breathe in and I breathe out. And so there are different things that you can do to teach your children how to cope. One thing would be making a storybook with them. Super easy, lots of fun. There's tons of apps out there to teach you how to do it. Another technique would be mindful meditation. And so what you would do with this is you sit them down and you have them be really still or they can lay down and you close their eyes, have them close their eyes and you take, you create a picture for them. So that might be, um, close your eyes, take a deep breath. Do you remember when we went to the beach? Do you remember how the water went out and in and out and in? Do you remember the way that the waves sound? Do you remember the way that the water felt? And so you're just talking them through There's their feelings and allowing them to just really become still with themselves. You can also um, have them visualize blowing up a balloon. Okay, I want you to close your eyes and pick a balloon of any color. What's your balloon color? And let them talk to you. Okay, all right, we're gonna blow your balloon up and it's gonna get bigger and bigger, okay? So I want you to take a deep breath in and blow your balloon. Take a deep breath in and blow your balloon. And these little things, these mindfulness techniques are really centered around helping them emotionally reset. So before they get to the point where they're emotionally hijacking you, when you see that the escalation is beginning, that's when you want to interfere and you want to say, hey, let's try this. Let's try this technique. Now, if you have older kids who are able to write, one of my favorite things to do is to write a gratitude list. You can write all the things you're thankful for. And if your kids are like mine, at first they're gonna be like, I'm not thankful for anything, especially if they're upset. And so you have them write down and say, it's okay. What, what's one thing that you are thankful for? What do you like to eat? I'm like, okay, I'm thankful for tacos. Okay, tacos, that's good. What else do you like? You know, who are your friends? Um, I know you're mad at me right now because I told you you can't have something, but you know, what about your dad? And so as you give them a, a, a starter to that list, then they start to create this list. And what it does is it helps them to shift their focus from being frustrated to being grateful. And gratefulness is the root of joy. Gratitude is the root of joy. And so it really helps them reframe. Another thing that I like to do, speaking of reframing, is I like to reframe a problem. Right now, with this virus going around, people are freaking out. And yes, it's very frustrating and it's very hard, but we can take this same situation and reframe it. We can say, yes, families are having to stick together. Families are getting to know each other now like never before. People are really finding cool, innovative ways to stay connected, to work, and to serve their customers or their employees. What a wonderful age we're in where so many people are coming up with business ideas or finally writing those books that they've been putting on hold for so long. And so reframing is taking a negative situation and trying to find something good out of it. My last tip for you is to have family goals. Here's the thing, you guys. We set goals for our careers. We set goals for our finances. We set goals for just about everything. But it's very rarely that people set goals for their relationships. And so set your goals for your relationships. What do you want your marriage with your spouse to look like in 10 years? What do you want your relationship with your children to look like in 10 years, in 20 years? What, do you, what kinds of conversations do you wanna have? How do you want them to relate to you? And when you look at your relationship from the perspective of having goals, it makes hard family conversations easier to have. You have them with a little more grace and gentleness because you have your goal in mind of, you know what, 
I really want to build our family, or I really want um, to be a safe place for my kids. I really want to be somebody that my spouse can confide in. And so when you set your familiar, your familial goals, it's really important that you take some time out and you look at what you are wanting out of that relationship, as well as what you are wanting to give. So for me personally, I want my children to be able to talk to me about anything. So this means when they come to me with their long drawn out stories, I can't go, oh, again? Instead, I get to be engaged. I get to be engaged, even if it's just for a few minutes, even if I have to put a time limit on it, I get to say, okay, tell me all about it. Mommy's here. And yes, I do get to also teach them boundaries and when is an appropriate time to talk and how sometimes mommy and daddy need their space. But I'm setting up goals. I'm setting up our relationship with our goals in mind. And so that's one technique that you can use. Also, as you're talking to your spouse or partner, sit down with them and ask them, what are some things that you want out of our relationship? Where do you see us 10 years from now? You know, marriage should not be the end. It should not be the goal. It should be the start. So, so often times people get married and, and then they stop. They stop planning for their relationship future. You know, you date and then you plan on getting engaged and then you plan on getting married and then what? In order to grow old together, you have to plan out what that looks like for you and for your family. And so now is a great time to do that. So just to recap, with your family and with your personal self, one of the strategies that you can use during this time is asking yourself the four questions. How am I feeling? When did I start to feel this way? Why do I feel this way? And how am I feeling? My next tip was to give your children the vocabulary to express how they're feeling. You want to make sure that you're empowering them with the correct words to identify their emotions. You also want to make sure that you are giving them coping skills. Take time to have a mindful meditation or to write gratitude lists. Make sure that you're taking the time to listen to them and to do things like creating a storybook for the young children. And as a family, set your goals intentionally. Think about what, your what lies in your future for your kids and your relationship with your kids, for your spouse and your relationship with your spouse. What are the things that you hope for? What are the things that you would like to see? Self-awareness is one of the hardest things. It can be very challenging to stop and identify your emotions because we live in a society where things move very quickly. Things are created very quickly. But one of the great um, gifts of this time is the ability to really take a minute and slow down. The ability to take some time and really sit with yourself. And so one last thing that I have for you and for your family is for you guys to write your success story. Whenever something crazy or terrible happens, something frustrating or overwhelming, I take the time out to write my success story. And I, I get detailed, very detailed. So I might say something along the lines of, oh my goodness, I only had $25 left in my bank account. My husband and I were fighting all the time. I had no idea what we were going to do. But then we were, this virus went around and we were stuck at home together and we had nothing but time. So I looked at my husband and I said, and I just write out this whole beautiful, elaborate story where I get to take charge of how I'm feeling. And I get to take charge of the trajectory of my life. And I want to give that gift to you today. I want to encourage you, take some time and really write your story. And here are some tips that you can use to write your story. The first thing is to identify where you are right now. How are you feeling? Like I was feeling frustrated. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm heartbroken. 
Um, I'm, I'm anxious. I'm depressed. But I'm walking around with a smile on my face because, you know, I don't want my husband to know or my wife to know. And so it's very important that you take the time out to really identify how you are feeling. Identify what is going through your mind. The second thing you want to do is lean into your and then, right? There's a moment, there's a catalyst, there's a shift that happens. And you get to choose what that shift is going to be. It can be that, you know, an explosive argument just happens. And now you have to figure out what you want to do. It can be that, you know, you just got an email from your job. And you don't know how much longer they're going to continue with your salary because of everything that's going on. It could be that your child walked by and looked at you and smiled like you were the answer to their every prayer or concern. You get to choose what your and then is, but we all have one. We all have one. Tragedy and crisis are crucibles for change. They're like incubators for brilliant ideas and innovations. We're never gonna get a time like this again. We're lucky to have this one. And so take all this pressure and figure out what your and then is going to be. Then take the time and write out your vision. Write it out, be explicit. What happens? What were you doing? What do you, what do you smell in the future? What does your success taste like, right? I'm so excited, I love to eat, so I always like to include where I'm going to eat. I love the water, so I'm always somewhere beachside. And write out your dreams so explicitly so that when you step into that moment in real life, you recognize it. And you're like, wow, this is it. This is it. So be explicit about where you are, what your feelings are now. Identify your and then moments. And then you want to write out your dream in great detail. You want to write down everything you smell, taste, and see, even what you feel, so that when you get there, you recognize it. And this is something that you can also do with your children. So here's a cool way to do it with your kids. You, with your kids, you can do it in a list form. You can say, how are you feeling right now? And then you write down everything that they're feeling. And then you say, okay, what's going on right now? And they'll say, you know, I'm stuck at home, man. Um, I can't go outside and play with my friends. Okay, let's write that down. You write the list of, of what's going on right now, why they're feeling what they're feeling. And then finally, you want to say, okay, so we can't change what's happening right this second, but we can change what we do about it. So what's going to come out of this? And then start writing a list of, you know, they created a... Um, fort in the backyard that was the most epic forts of forts in the world. Or they um, wrote, wrote a story or, a, or a, a, a book or created a play or had a YouTube channel or whatever. But now is the time to really be able to zero in on what it is that they need in order to be successful or feel successful. And then after they accomplish that success, you want to highlight it and say, hey, you guys, did you realize that you're living your success story? Because that creates a habit. And what happens is you're teaching them that, hey, hard times are gonna happen, you have feelings about them, you can change that. And it teaches them the pattern that you want them to have as they're going into adulthood and having to cope with all of these different struggles and challenges that life brings. If you guys would like to connect with me, you can connect with me on my website, lianajames.com. My homeschool website is melanintalk.com. And you can connect with me on Instagram with at melanintalk or on facebook.com slash melanintalk. I'm here to answer any questions that you have. I have um, courses and literature available on my website, so feel free.
to help yourself um, to ordering whatever it is you need. And if there's everything, anything that I can do to support you in your journey as you are embarking on uncharted territory as a homeschool parent for the first time who's also working at home, or if you're a seasoned homeschool parent and you're just looking for some new resources, make sure that um, you connect with me. All right. I hope you found this information valuable, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Bye. Hi, my name is Christina Corvo, and I am one of the founding partners and creators of Lit League. And Lit League is a subscription box service for kids that offers book themed activity boxes. And part of what motivated me and my partners to found this organization was our passion for reading and our belief that reading should be an essential part of every child's life. And there's so many studies that show the benefits of reading and how the amount of reading and the joy a child takes in reading are big predictors of how successful a child will be in life. So you can never get too much reading over life, which is why we're doing this presentation on how to create a culture of reading within the home. Now I'm gonna go ahead and take you to my presentation. So you'll be able to see me, both me and that. So let's go ahead and talk through some, of, some ways that you can create a culture of reading in your home. Now we're gonna start with the most basic which is reading to your kids. And while this may seem basic and like something that should be obvious, over 50% of parents don't actually spend time reading to their kids on a daily basis. And that statistic may seem shocking, but if you think about busy lives, reading can be one of those things that's easy to forget to do or to neglect, even if it's something that you believe is essential and important to your kid's life. Now, a couple of points I want to make about this. One is that I think sometimes parents don't read because they feel like it needs to be done in a set way that might not fit with their schedule. Like bedtime might be a chaotic time in your household. So bedtime reading might not work. Or maybe morning reading, which works for some families, might not work because everybody's in a rush to get somewhere. Um, so you need to find a way to incorporate reading that works for you and for your family. For me, um, there are sort of two main times that work for us. Sometimes bedtime reading does, but I can't count on that happening every day. Um, so two things I do. One is I keep a stack of books in our car um, because I have two children and oftentimes one child has an activity while the other doesn't or one child finishes an activity before the other is done. And so during that lag time, I find the opportunity to read a book and it only takes a few minutes to read a picture book or a chapter in a larger book. So it's not a lot of time. So if I have the books available, we can either sit in the car and read or I can bring them into wherever the event is taking place. Another time that I find is a good opportunity for reading in our home is around meal times, particularly dinner time or weekend breakfast times because I am often finished eating before my children are. So I keep a stack of books at the end of the dining room table or, on the, or nearby. And then when they finish eating or when I finish eating, I will choose a book and read it. Um, doesn't take much time and then it's a good way to get reading in. And another point I want to make about reading to kids is that a lot of times people don't stop reading to children once they are able to read for themselves, particularly once they are reading chapter books. And this is something I want to discourage you from doing because even big kids value that cherished reading time, those extra cuddles, uh, that extra bonding time together. It makes reading something that feels special to them and enjoyable and something that's apart from school or work or something that they have to do um, you know, as an added challenge. It just makes it fun. Another point about making reading a part of your home is to, whenever possible, have a variety of adults read to your children. So whatever adults are involved in your children's lives, grandparents, aunts, uncles, family, friends, child, you know, babysitters, whoever, get them reading to your child. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is everybody has a different approach. And there's even studies that show that mothers and fathers or men and women 
sometimes have different ways of reading, different questions that they ask, different things that they emphasize during the act of reading. So that will give your child a variety of experiences with reading aloud. And then the additional reason why it's important to have a variety of adults read to your children is because then it makes them feel like they are part of a larger community of readers. It feels like something that's not just a school activity or not just something that their mommy does or their daddy or whoever, but something that all people want to do and should do. So it's really important to do that. Now, personally, whenever I have another adult outside the home visiting, a grandparent or even a babysitter, um, I always <laughs> hand them a stack of books and encourage them, you know, maybe forcefully, to make reading a part of their time with my children because I think that's so important and it's a great opportunity to do so, whether that's over a meal, as I said, because my child gets done, you know, eating early or just sitting down on the couch and cuddling together. But reading is really important. We also believe very much in the importance of making reading fun. You want reading to be something that children associate with laughter and silliness because children love laughter and silliness. So one way you can make reading extra fun is to play games connected to the books you read. Now the games you play will depend on the age and interest of your children with pre-readers or early readers. It might be games like find the letters that spell out your child's name as you go through the book because a name is the first thing a child often learns to spell, so this can be fun for them. It could be searching for all the words that start with a certain letter. It could be searching for a specific list of high frequency or sight words like am and was and he and it, seeing how many of each of those that can be found in a book and maybe guessing ahead of time which one they'll find the most of. The possibilities are really endless. Um, with older children, playing a rhyming game after reading a book with rhymes can be fun or looking for, um, you know, for older readers even, looking for figurative language like find all the similes and metaphors. You know, there's lots of different ways to use, incorporate games within looking at books. You can even do a book scavenger hunt um, where you have a list of things for children to find in a picture or chapter book. And that could be, you know, for a picture book for younger children, it might be something like find a capital A find, you know, the word child, you know, whatever it is you want them to look for. And then for older kids, you know, maybe find a word that for something other than that means the same thing as smart, you know, synonyms or things like that. And Lit League actually puts together book scavenger hunts periodically that we post on um, our website. And you can always check out our website, litleagueboxes.com to see if we have any free reading downloads or other activities. You can also follow us at, at litleagueboxes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook because we post these sorts of things all the time because we want to help you interact with books with your children. Another way to engage your children in reading is to discuss books as you read them together. Even though it may seem like it might be distracting, it actually can be a way to get younger children more interested, to pause while reading aloud, to ask questions, to make predictions about what will happen, and to discuss the images that they see. You know, like if you see a picture of a girl or of an animal, you know, does, how does that animal feel, do you think? What expression do they have? What do you think they're about to do? Um, simple questions like that. And with older kids, you can talk about the books, you know, after they've read them, if they're reading independently at the time. Now, we know that with older kids, especially in chapter books, parents don't always have the time to read the entire book, which is why one of the things we provide in our Lit League boxes are um, book-specific vocabulary bookmarks that also contain discussion questions, general ones you can ask, and also we include discussion questions and answers to help you in preparing to talk about your books. But whatever way you do it, talking to your books, talking to your children about their books will get them engaged in another way. Now these are just a few ways that you can get your children engaged in reading. Let's look at some other ways that you can do this. So one way is to let your kids catch you reading actual books. Remember that reading on electronic devices doesn't have the same impact. Um, now, the reason why we want our children to catch us reading on actual books is because we want them to think that reading is something we do too. That It's not just something we make them do. And children often model what the adults around them are doing, right? Think about the ways that children like to play and play cook in, in pretend kitchens or pretend to run a restaurant or a store, right? The things they see adults doing are things that they want to do. So if they see us reading, then that will make them want to read too. So it's a way to teach them that reading is important without having to say a word. Now, the reason why not on electronic devices is because when children see us on computers or iPads or 
smartphones, they can't tell what we're doing. And even if we say we're reading, it's not gonna have the same impact as them actually seeing us physically reading with a book. So even if you are somebody who prefers to read on electronic devices, I would encourage you to find ways to be intentional about getting your children to catch you reading actual books. So even if that means setting the stage for such a moment, like when you know they're gonna come down in the morning and pulling out a book, so the first thing they see you doing in the morning is reading, or for those kids who pop out of bed at night during bedtime, while you are waiting to tuck them back in, be holding a book. So when they come out for you to put them back into bed, they see you reading. So just find opportunities to have them catch you reading. I talked about the fact that reading is an important predictor of, of child success. A tangible predictor of child success that's been found in study after study is the number of books a child has at home. That is a direct correlation between the number of books at home and the, the educational level a child is able to achieve later in life. Now, I think part of this has to do with the fact that the types of parents who surround their children with books are the types who generally care about education and will be the type to nurture and support their child's educational ambitions. So to set yourself up with that kind of household, you wanna help your child have their own personal library with physical books on display, um, both for yourself and for your children. So there's a number of ways that you can achieve this without you know, spending large amounts of money. One is you can have a shelf dedicated to library books. Most libraries will let you check up anywhere from check out anywhere from 15 to 40 books at a time. So you can have a shelf that you are constantly replenishing with new books from the library. So you can rotate through books that way, both for yourself and for your children. Another way is to go to um, used bookstores. There's lots of those around that you can pick up books for very reasonable or even Thrift stores like Goodwill stores and such often carry used books that you can get at very inexpensive prices. So there's a lot of ways to stock up on books without spending a lot. Yard sales are a great place to go for that too. And speaking of the library, another way to get your children excited about reading is to visit your local library often. Now, obviously one of the reasons to do so is so you can actually get books in their hands and children being able to pick out their own books. This is something that they really treasure and that sense of ownership is really helps them to connect to the books in a different way. Um, and even just the act of owning a library card and having to be responsible for holding on to that and remembering to bring it is a great way to teach your child responsibility in addition to a passion for reading. But in addition to the books themselves, libraries offer so many great activities throughout the year, especially during summer, there's a lot of programs then, but even during the school year, they offer story times, music times, all sorts of things to get your children excited about being somewhere where books are valued and at the center of all activities. Another way to create a culture of reading in the home is to give books as gifts. If we give books as gifts to our children or to other people and your children see that, it tells them that a book is something valuable. A book is something worthy of being a gift. So a couple of ways that this can take place in your home. One is if you are a home that you know, has the Easter Bunny visit or the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus, those people, those creatures, <laughs> however you wanna call them, can bring books as gifts. If your child, like in this picture above, receives gifts in their basket from the Easter Bunny, that tells them not only do my mom and dad think books are important, but the Easter Bunny thinks books are important. So that's one way to communicate without having to say anything, that books are something to be valued. Also, if you're going to a birthday party for another child, get your child involved in picking out a book for that child as their gift. Going to a, a tangible bookstore, even better, because then they get to see that there's an exciting and fun place they can visit to pick out books from a vast collection of them, that new book smell, um, and have them pick out a book to help you wrap to then gift to a friend or family member. You can even give book themed gifts, like if you see down below, um, this gift was enjoyed by a young boy, Captain Underpants, as well as some silly underwear that goes along with that theme. Because again, children like to be silly and to make it more fun. Um, and our boxes, Lit League's book boxes, are intended both to be enjoyed at home and also to be given as gifts. You can see in the bottom right hand corner, each one comes in a gift box, which has that one has a book on top of it, Hello, the book Hello Ocean by Pam Munoz Ryan. And each box comes accompanied with a picture book or a chapter book, as well as the vocabulary bookmark I mentioned, discussion questions and answers, which I also mentioned, and then the, the materials to complete four to five activities that are themed around the book. So in this case, these would be a box of ocean activities with seashells and an ocean painting activity and other things to go along with it. Now, another way to make reading a natural and fun part 
of your house, but also to add enrichment is to create a word or sentence wall to make learning new words part of daily life. Now, you don't want it to feel like a drill and you don't want it to feel like a you know, forced challenge. So you wanna make it feel natural. Um, felt boards or magnet boards work great. In my home, what I do is I take um, a magnet board and it's posted on the door right near our dining room table. So while we're sitting at mealtime, it can be easily seen. And I use it with my younger daughter who's still an emerging reader. And so every, every week I write a new sentence and then I have her a few times a week, you know, not every single day, but whenever I think about it, whenever we have a little lag time at the dinner table, I ask her or breakfast table, I ask her to look over and read the sentence. And then once she's mastered the sentence, I change it to a new one. And that's just how a way we do it. So I just make it something fun and it gives her a sense of pride too, being able to read the sentence, being able to share with other people like her big sister that she can read the sentence. And it's just a good way to incorporate the use of words and new words in daily life. So you can do it as part of a storytelling act, like the example of the felt board, or just part of practicing high frequency words or the week's vocabulary um, with your schoolwork. Or sometimes I'll post sentences that have to do with upcoming activities or things that happened that week. Um, so that they have a connection to what's going on in real life. Now, another way to expand the learning fund and part of the actual initial inspiration for Lit League is to create a book club, club within your family or with your child's friends. So this doesn't have to be something super involved. It doesn't have to be something that feels overwhelming. It can be something that meets as frequently or infrequently as you want. Again, it can just be a book club with one child and a parent or parents, or it can be with a book club with siblings, or a book club with friends. Now, all you need to do to start a book club is have a book and an activity to go with that book. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be that involved. So for a picture book, you could simply pick a date, have children over, and instead of having a traditional play date, make it a book club play date where you read the book and then you have an activity or even activity and a fun snack that's paired with that book. For older children, you wanna allow enough time in between meetings if you're gonna meet regularly or even if you're just going to do it a one-time thing, allow enough time for the children to all read the same chapter book. And then same thing, you'd pick a time, you know, probably with older kids, since you're not reading it together, it'd be good to have some discussion questions to refresh everybody on it, have them talk it out, and then again, have activities to go along with it. Now, one of the things we've done at Litley is designed our boxes to lend themselves to creating book clubs within your family or friends. So there are a lot of shared activities. There's a lot of games that are fun played with more than one. Um, with our picture book boxes, we have physical playtime because little kids need to move that accompany um, the theme of each book. And then they're designed so that you could easily pair them with friends who decide to get involved in Lit League as well, or you could do them with siblings, um, however you like to do it. And the inspiration, initial inspiration behind Lit League came from um, one of the founding members who started a book club for her daughter when her daughter was kinder in kindergarten. Um, and both this founder and I um, have an experience teaching high school English. I teach college as well. Um, and we saw how when children were older, they often lost interest in reading. And there's actually a statistic called decline by nine, known by educators, which cites the fact that, and a lot of these studies came out in 2019, but there were others before this, um, Despite the fact that at age nine, there's a huge drop off in reading interest and passion for reading. Um, just to cite one statistic, children who are eight years old during the study cited that they were over 50% over of them cited an, an interest, noted interest and passion for reading. And that love of reading for nine year olds, those same nine year olds dropped from over 50% to around 30%. And that was just in one year. Um, and so part of what motivated us to start this book club, and the numbers keep going down from there, is because we wanna fight that decline by nine. We wanna keep children interested and engaged in reading. And there's two reasons I think that that decline happened, although there's lots of factors, but one is that around nine is, is around the age a lot of children stop being read to completely by caregivers because they can read independently. And so it's no longer this fun, fuzzy, warm experience. It's something that they have to work at independently. And for some children, it still feels like work at age nine. It's not easy. And then another reason is that around age nine is a lot of times when the academic pressures associated with reading really come to bear, where all subjects really depend on them reading texts and absorbing them. And they're not doing as much fun reading if that's not something that their family is intentionally including 
in their lives. So we try to fight this and a book club is just one way to do that, to make it seem like something fun and something that we do as a community and all together. Now, these are many fun ways to make reading exciting and, and entertaining and something that your children would love to do. But we wanna show you some more ways that you can do this. So let's go ahead and look at some more ways that we can make reading fun and exciting for our children. Now, we've talked about book clubs, but another way that you can make them fun is by finding themed books to go along with family outings and trips. These can be read ahead of the experience or taken along to enjoy. And you might even plan outings related to specific books. So for example, in terms of taking books to go along with themed outings, if you're going to a classical music concert, such as the example in the bottom right-hand corner, you might bring a book about classical music or conductors. Um, you know, when I took my daughters to a concert for the first time, this book, Zin Zin Zin, a violin, was one that I always brought along because it's a great book that teaches about a lot of the instruments um, in the orchestra. And so we could read it before we went and then inside um, the theater right before the show went on to remind ourselves of all the instruments that we would be able to listen to. Um, you can also plan outings, like I said, to go along with the book. So like for the middle example, there's a book called Escape from Mr. Limoncello's Library that inspired a group visit from a book club to an escape room to go along with that book. Um, or if you're planning a vacation somewhere that fits really nicely with a book and you want to add that as part of the vacation experience, you can do it. Like if you're going to Wisconsin and you make a chance to stop by an old world Wisconsin where you can see the little house um, sort of inspired cabins and all of that or any log cabins you might visit anywhere in the United States or thinking about, you know, kind of pioneer days, bring along Little House in the Prairie and read it either along the trip, if it's a long trip or before you go, and then just revisit some of the excerpts as you're there to remind yourself and ground yourself in that place through the book. It just really brings the book to life for your children. And just another simple way to do it, um, you know, whenever I'm going to take my children to snow, since we live in California, so we don't get to enjoy all the seasons um, that I enjoyed as a child growing up in Illinois, we always prepare for this time in the snow, um, reading books about winter and snow and snow outings like sledding and skiing and all of that. So we bring, we read some books before we go and then take them along to read as part of it um, to really enhance the experience. So a lot of the ones we've mentioned so far are sort of easy daily things you can do or intentional ways to include reading. You can also make um, make it a point of having sort of more sustaining, sustained projects related to books to get your children excited about them. So one thing you can do is help your children write their own stories or poems um, to, because that sense of authorship will really get them engaged in the writing community and which will also get them excited to read. Now obviously poems are a little bit less involved and that can be done in a really easy short way. A lot of our book boxes involve poem activities and currently on our website we have a spring reading page with free downloads and one of them is a page of spring poems to be enjoyed by children and their families as well as prompts for doing imitations or responses to some poetic responses to all of those poems if you would like um, because again getting children writing on their own helps them engage with reading and writing and just the power and beauty of words um, in terms of writing their own stories you could even go so far as to create an actual book with illustrations as a family this could even be used as a holiday gift um, for family members. So there are lots of ways to create a book. It could be something as simple as just stapling together construction paper, white construction paper, and doing your illustrations and writing in that. You can even buy these bound books different places that are easy to, to use. Um, so just as a personal example, um, we decided, my family, to create, well, sort of organically came about, to create a holiday book. Um, that we started a year before gifting. Um, so not this past Christmas, but the one before. Um, my daughters and I are reading a book called The Christmas Quiet. And just naturally around the house, we started coming up with um, other, other Christmas sayings. So in the book, it talks about, you know, Christmas is a quiet time, you know, looking at, pre peeking at presents quiet, decorating the tree quiet. So we came up with, uh, my daughters and I started throwing out Christmas is a cozy time, like hot cocoa cozy, sitting in front of the fire cozy. And then we started going into Christmas is a slippery time, you know, sledding hill slippery, ice skating slippery. And so I ended up typing up all of those and then realized that we could create our own book with all of these things we'd come up with. And so I organized it and then it became a whole family project where we each took on some of the illustrations and we worked on it throughout a whole year because I wanted it to feel fun not something stressful or pressured, but something we could all enjoy together. It was a fun family activity. And then 
slowly over the course of the year, we worked through it and got it done. And since I knew we wanted to gift these and I wanted to, the children to feel published, um, I ended up using a um, photo book website, Shutterfly is what I used, and I scanned their illustrations and then I typed in um, the words of our book into the caption section of a photo album and then I printed them out. So I used the photo, photo album template to make our books and then we were able to gift them to grandparents and aunts and uncles and the children had a great sense of accomplishment feeling like, yes, this is my book. Um, you can also have your children write fan fiction. Fan fiction is when you respond to well-known book lines, book characters, and create your own stories about them. So this is great if your children have any particular characters or um, storylines they're really interested in. So we have an example here, this Peggy Periwinkle and the Invisible Monster, which was some fan fiction inspired by the Strawberry Shortcake characters. Um, but you could do it for anything. So if you have a child who's really into Ladybug Girl, for example, you might do a Ladybug Girl book. Your child might be inspired to come up with a story for what might Ladybug Girl do now. If you have a child who's really into Magic Treehouse and history, then maybe you come up with a time period that's really interesting to them. You guys research it together and then they can create a story of what might happen going back in time there. There's lots of endless opportunities for fan fiction. Another great way to get your kids excited about reading is to set reading goals. So there's a lot, you can set short-term goals, longer-term goals. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, themed reading for specific months, like April is National Poetry Month. So I set a goal of trying to read, have my children read aloud or have me read one poem a day throughout the month of April. That's just a fun reading goal that we often do. Um, also during summer, Lit League hosts a 100 books of summer challenge. So I'll show you this. And that may sound overwhelming, 100 books, but if you think about 100 picture books, they're pretty short or 100 chapters if you choose to do that with an older child. During the summer, there's something called summer slide that often happens where children lose some of their reading and math abilities in particular. And so having them read aloud in an intentional way during the summer is a great way to avoid that summer slide. And it may, like I said, it may sound overwhelming, but it doesn't take that long. And I usually start my 100 books of summer at the beginning of June because schoolwork tends to be light and mostly review. And so by the end of June last summer, we were about 40 books into our 100 books of summer. Now, one thing I wanna mention about reading goals is one, I think, misconception people have with older children, children who are capable and interested, capable of reading and interested in reading chapter books, is they think that then picture books should be set aside as something babyish or not important, but I would encourage you with older children or as your children get older to not do that. You, certainly there are some books like some board books or, you know, the step one sort of introduction to reading book that are simplistic, but there are a lot of beautiful, rich picture books that actually have higher vocabulary than early reader chapter books in particular, and even some middle grade chapter books. There's just some vocabulary and world building and introduction to time periods and people and history that doesn't happen as frequently sometimes in particularly the early chapter books. So one challenge I did with my older daughter is the summer before third and fourth grade for her Hunter books of summer. We worked our way through um, as much of the Caldecott list as we could because the Caldecott list has is rich with beautifully written children's books. Um, and some of them, you know, date, I think it dates back to the 1930s. So you get some interesting slices of time as you go through those books. So, but they're gonna be great ways. And when you do reading goals, um, especially big ones like Hunter Books of Summer, you can choose to accompany reasonable kid shows and rewards with those. That's up to you. I know parents feel differently about rewards. Um, what we do in my house with the Hunter Books of Summer, food is something we all enjoy. So 50 books in, the children get to pick a sweet treat, like going out to ice cream or getting a baked good from their favorite bakery, something like that. And then when they hit 100 books, they get to go to a restaurant of their choice with the parent of their choice. So <laughs> I know my youngest daughter, she chose Chuck E. Cheese last summer. I think my oldest one chose to go to a burger joint, um, but somewhere that they're excited about. Again, just the goal is to get them excited about reading and make it always feel fun. Just to emphasize a point I've been touching on throughout the presentation, you want to make everything about um, reading about the joy of the experience. It should always be about the fun. And with Lit League, we do that by incorporating art activities and cooking activities within our book boxes. But at home, I've given you so many different ways to do that, but you want reading to be something filled with joy. And on a related note, try not to be overly concerned if reading doesn't come easily 
to your child. Not all children read at the same pace, even though there are state standards that dictate when we want our children to be competent readers by. Just know that for some children it comes naturally and for some it will be a struggle and that's not something to be overly concerned with. I have friends who are high school English teachers who did not become solid readers until second grade. My own older daughter um, really struggled with reading. It's not something that came naturally. Now, you can notice I say here, if you're worried, don't convey that to your child. You, now, children pick up on everything we say. We never want our children to associate reading with struggle or failure, failure or make them feel like they're not good enough. So I would say internalize that worry. Don't ever talk about it in front of them because children are little sponges. They pick up on all of that. And certainly don't ever say it directly to them. Instead, find intentional ways to help them support their reading. Like with my daughter, it was a lot of sitting down, working through like phonetic awareness didn't come naturally to her. So sit, sitting down and really working through sounding out words and working through flashcards, not in an excessive way. I tried to just, you know, I didn't go hard with it during the school year, but during the summer as part of the 100 books of summer, we really, really sat down and worked on reading. And even when she got frustrated and wasn't always enjoying it, I tried to keep my tone always positive without free of pressure. And now she's above grade level as a reader and I have to get her to turn off the flashlight at night um, because she wants to keep reading, which is what we wanna aim for. We want our children to love to read. Feel free to visit our website for further ideas about reading or again, to check us out at, at Lit League Boxes at both Instagram, all three, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for more ideas about how to get your kids excited about reading because that's really what it's all about. If we can get reading something your child loves, that's the best thing we can do for them. Thank you so much for listening. Hello everyone, my name is JJ Wimrick. I'm a certified financial planner professional and author of the book, Teaching Kids to Buy Stocks, Stories and Lessons for Grown-Ups. Today we're gonna to talk about one of my favorite topics, the stock market. It's important to note that there's more than just the stock market out there. There's a lot of markets. There's the bond market, there's the real estate market, the currency market, the commodities market. I could go on and on. But today we're going to focus on the stock market. I've been in the investment business for 19 years, but I actually became interested in the markets in seventh grade thanks to a wonderful group of teachers and professionals where I grew up in rural Kansas. I wouldn't have been able to learn the things I learned so young, if I hadn't had great teachers that helped to simplify things down to a level that even a, even a kid could understand. My goal today is to share some of those same lessons with you so that you feel comfortable having conversations with your kids. And I'm also gonna share some context on the current market environment that we find ourselves in. So with that, let's dig in. So what do you think of when you hear those words, the stock market? Does it make you think of your 401k and retirement accounts? Does it maybe make you think of your kids' college savings funds? Does it create an emotional response? Has that emotional response changed in the last couple of months with everything that's happened? What about your kids? Do they know what the stock market is? Do they know what a share of stock represents? Maybe you just try not to think about it. Maybe you don't feel anything at all. Maybe it's something you just don't pay attention to. I know for some, the stock market seems so complicated and foreign that they try not to think about it. They know it's there and it's something that they should probably care about, but they don't because it just seems too complex. Well, no matter how you answer those questions, I have something for you today. You see, I know the emotions that people feel. First and foremost, fear and greed, they can be quite powerful. And those are the two emotions that can lead us to make bad financial decisions and often at the most inopportune times. I know these emotions because I feel them too, but I've also given talks to and had conversations with thousands of people in my career about investing and the stock market. Including, that included in that group are thousands of financial investment professionals that I've consulted along the way. Let me give you a little bit of background on me. My first seven years in the investment business were spent working as a financial advisor for the general public. I spent the next 12 years of my 19 year career as an investment consultant to financial and investment professionals and their clients. In this role, I was often asked to speak at events for these financial professionals 
all in an effort to help simplify what was going on in the markets at the time with the end goal of reducing the emotional response and to allow folks to make decisions with their thinking brain and not with their fight or flight brain. Now, during these 19 years, I've also had the wonderful luxury of teaching my kids the basics of the stock market as they've grown up. My wife of 18 years, Jody, she was a fellow financial advisor when we met and then were married. And our children are now seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. Plus, I have a stepson who is 28, and he is actually a successful investment professional in his own right. Now, I didn't all of a sudden just teach them one day, hey, here, kids, it's a, here's the stock market. It was more of an evolution over time that started with conversations about money and conversations about saving. These lessons were nothing complicated. In fact, they were quite simple. Anyone could do the same thing with their children. It doesn't take a financial professional. All it takes is a parent or a teacher that chooses to have a few extra conversations in the course of their day-to-day -day life. You see, from when my kids were barely old enough to stop putting the coins in their mouth, my wife and I began talking about money and talking about business to them. This eventually led to deeper conversations, challenges to save their money, and then eventually them actually investing the money that they'd saved into the stock market. A funny thing happened in that process. I was able to see the market through the eyes of my kids. As any parent knows, it is truly amazing to see the world through the eyes of a child. When a child sees something for the first time, they do it without all of the biases and the baggage that, that we grown-ups carry with us. That's why kids say the darndest things, right? Well, let me tell you, my kids said the darndest things as well as they began to understand. Many of the things they said were so good, they became, became part of my talks and part of my conversations professionally. And some of those things I'll share as we go along. More on that in a bit. For the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you a few things. First, I'll share how I was able to help my children, beginning when they were young, to understand the value of money, how we challenged them to save, and how we used our everyday conversations as a springboard to lessons about investing, lessons about buying stocks in the stock market, and other things. You may find that you can follow these same steps with your kids. Even if you don't feel qualified to teach them about the stock market, you're qualified. You'll be surprised at what you already know. Second, I'm going to share some of the stories and lessons that I've helped teach both financial advisors and then their clients the basics of investing and the basics of the stock market. And the third thing I'm going to try to do today is give you some perspective on the current market environment that we find ourselves in. Some things to think about as you consider your own retirement and education investments. So here goes. How do you raise kids that make good financial decisions? Well, talk to them about money. And once a child realizes that you can trade these coins and bills in for candy and toys, they want to make that happen as quickly as possible, right? Well, my kids were no different. My wife and I, we are believers in chores and believers in allowance. And we began making them work for their money early on. But we also challenged them to save their money, and we did that by giving them an incentive to do so. It became known as the $500 challenge. We told them, if you can save $500, then we'll match it. Now, they were pretty young, and it took them a little while for them to, to save that much money, but they did it. And what's better is they not only looked to save their birthday and their holiday money and their allowances, but they also looked for ways to make additional money as a result of the challenge. It made them a little bit more entrepreneurial, a little bit more inclined to, to help with extra chores if that meant they could, they could get a little bit of extra money. I've heard of other parents doing similar things, but in different ways. Some parents will maybe challenge their children over their summer vacation. See if you can save $50. See if you can save $100. But the point is to, to, to talk to them about saving cash and teach them the self-discipline necessary to do so. You see, if we as parents don't teach them that self-discipline, then who will? Most of us aren't just naturally wired to be savers, especially when you look at how we're all bombarded with marketing and advertising. And this marketing and advertising, it's scientifically designed to make us want to fork over our hard-earned dollars for whatever it is. Now, our family's $500 challenge turned out to be a bit of a bait and switch. We eventually told the kids that they weren't going to just get 500 free dollars to blow on whatever they wanted. Instead, 
they were going to use that money to buy a stock or two. It took them long enough to save that we were able to fit in the lessons necessary for them to understand what that meant by the time that they had the money. We were also naturally teaching them one of the most important rules of investing as a part of this process. Lesson number one, don't invest until you've saved an ample amount of cash first. Too often, I see grown-ups asking me about what stocks should I buy or you know, what should I do to begin investing before they've really saved enough cash in an emergency fund. Sometimes folks are in a bit of a tight situation financially, and they're tempted to want to buy stocks because they think if I can make some money on this stock, it'll relieve that tightness. But that's a very dangerous frame of mind and dangerous behavior. You see, the only guarantee in investing is that the prices are going to fluctuate. And if you don't have a strong cash reserve, you may be forced to sell your investments at an inopportune time to do so just because of life. There's a saying from author Jane Bryant Quinn, the shortest period of time lies between the minute you put some money away for a rainy day and the unexpected arrival of rain. So back to the kids and back to talking to them about stocks. You see, the stock market can seem like this big mysterious thing, but really, it's just a collection of companies. Some of those companies are good, some not so good. But it's a market of stocks, if you will, not just the stock market. And it's important to understand, stocks are businesses. We all visit businesses, or at least we used to, as part of our everyday life. And we often do this with our kids. Why not use this as an opportunity to not just talk about money and how much things cost, which are very important things to talk about if you're not already, but also talk about the business that you're supporting. Whether you're at the grocery store, at a restaurant, or if you're taking your child to spend their own money, talk about the businesses associated with that. Explain how the store you're at makes money. Talk about the product that you're purchasing and how that company makes money. You see, these conversations not only lead you to discussions about stocks in the stock market, if you do it right, but they help your child view the world from the eyes of the business owner and not just the eyes of the customer. It also makes them a more, more prudent and a better consumer and more likely to pay attention to things and pay attention to when they may be getting a good deal or a bad deal. Now, at some point in the conversation, depending on how old the kids are and how well they understand things, explain that some of these companies that we're visiting, some of these companies that we're talking about, they're available for anyone to purchase as an owner. You can actually own the company. Now, some companies are private, and some companies are what we call publicly traded, meaning you can actually become one of the partial owners of that company by buying their stock. Now, not every business is a good one. We've all had experiences with a product or service that didn't meet our expectations. And the same is true with the stock market. Not every stock is worth owning. What you want to do, you want to look for businesses that even a kid will say, man, I wish I owned that company. In our family, we have a saying, if there's a line out the door, do some research. Some of the best stocks of the last 10 years featured lines of happy paying customers waiting outside the door, ready to fork over their money. Let's think about some examples. Apple, we saw lines out the door waiting for their phones for years and years. Uh, Chipotle Mexican Grill is the place that we love to go, and I've waited in plenty of lines there. Starbucks, Costco. It's easy while you're waiting in line. Have that conversation with the child about, you know, you can actually buy this company. Seems like they're doing pretty good, right? Um, even Amazon is an example. Now, Amazon obviously didn't have lines of customers waiting out their doors because they don't have retail doors. But I know when I came home from work, a lot of times I saw a line of boxes waiting for me to get into the recycle bin. That's another good example. Hey, there's a pretty good business going on here. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is some sort of foolproof method to buying stocks, but it's a good start. Look for things that you know, look for businesses that you know are good, and then do your research from there. As our kids began to learn about money and they began to spend the money that they had saved or that they were given as gifts, they became better consumers as well. One of our early experiences was with the toy store Toys R Us. When the kids were very young, they used to love going to Toys R Us to see all the cool new toys. But once they began spending their own money, their opinions changed. 
they realized that they could stretch their dollars a little bit further by being price conscious. It didn't take a math whiz for them to realize that $25 at Toys R Us didn't quite go as far as $25 at Walmart or Target. It wasn't a shock for my children, who were really not very old at the time, to discover that their old toddler stomping grounds was shutting its doors and going out of business. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that price is the only thing that matters as a consumer. There are many locally owned stores that may not offer the best deal compared to a chain, but we shop there anyway because we want to see our local businesses survive. But the point is, have the conversations with your kids and have them early and often so that they understand how we vote with our dollars. The point in telling you this is simple. Stocks follow earnings. It's a phrase I've become known for. Let me put it another way. Stock prices tend to follow the same path as a company's projected profits. If a company's profits are heading higher, expect that the stock price is going to follow a similar path. Maybe it won't follow it every day, week, month, or even every year, but over any longer term time frame, companies that continuously grow their sales and continuously grow their profits, they're going to tend to see their stock price grow as well. But keep in mind, not every company has just limitless growth. There are companies that are fads and they may seem hotter than an Arizona sidewalk for a little bit, only to see that fad fade as well as the stock price fade. Other companies, they are so completely disruptive to the status quo and they can grow their profits for far longer than many really think possible. In addition, as companies grow, they may begin to pay out some of their profits in the form of cash to their shareholders. Your larger, your older companies, a lot of them pay out cash to their shareholders in what's known as a dividend. When my oldest son, Max, discovered that after he'd bought some Apple stock, he started to see the dividend come in. He says, wow, that's pretty cool. I've got cash coming into the account that I'll be able to do something with. He says, maybe if I just keep buying shares, when I'm old like you, Dad, I can let those shares pay my income and I won't have to work all the time like you do. Wiser words have never been said. So another favorite saying of my, mine comes from economist John Keynes. He says, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? One of the biggest barriers to both intellectual growth and investment growth is anchoring your mind to a fixed opinion or a fixed data point. It's okay to be wrong. We're all going to be wrong quite often over the course of our lives and including when investing. It is dangerous and unhealthy to be able to, unable to admit as much or to be too stubborn to admit that maybe we missed something, maybe we got something wrong. So don't let your ego get in the way of making smart choices. When the facts change, it's okay to change your mind. The world is always changing. We're always learning new things. And it's important to try to keep our eyes wide open as to how we might, might be misinterpreting reality. And that brings us to today. In the current situation regarding the coronavirus and the impact on the economy, and therefore the impact that we've seen on the stock market, if there's one thing that the stock market does not like, it's uncertainty. As I mentioned, stocks follow earnings, and right now, the picture for corporate earnings is as uncertain as at any time since the 9-11 attacks. It's very hard, if not impossible, to value a company or the basket of companies that encompass the entire market when we don't know when the customers will return. That's why you're seeing such violent swings both up and down over the last couple months. Anyone that tells you that they are certain what will happen is certainly guessing, and that myself included. Now, I'm very confident that eventually we will get through this season that we're in. We will return to some level of normal, even if it doesn't look exactly the same way as before. The history of our country, the history of our society, and our species is one of overcoming adversity and returning stronger than before. But as always, the timing is the greatest variable. So what's an investor to do? What do you do if you've seen your retirement funds or college funds severely impacted by the decline in the stock market? While everyone's situation is different and personal, let me share some perspective. First off, as mentioned previously, your first investment should always be your emergency fund. 
you should strive to save at least three to six months of your living expenses in a cash reserve. Now, this may seem like a lot of money, but that's the point. And this current situation has certainly highlighted the fact that we don't know when things will change for better or for worse. We might need to rely on those dollars to get us through a storm. So again, your first investment should be in your emergency fund. I understand that, that many folks get a match on their 401k, and I don't want to see you forego that free money, but that's not a reason to forego your cash reserve either. It's imperative to find a way to budget yourself to be able to take advantage of that free money, but to also build up your emergency reserve. And I'm not saying it's easy, but paying, in tax, paying taxes and penalties to pull money from a 401k in, emergen in an emergency, that's almost as inefficient as leaving the free money on the table. Second, understand that money in the market is money at risk. When choosing your allocations within your retirement plans or your college plans, know that you have more than just stock market options within your plan. And some of those stock market options might be more risky than others. You're also going to have the options to invest in the bond market, which tend to decline less, or sometimes they even go up in a bear market for stocks. You may also have a money market or a fixed account as an option. Be self-aware of how you feel about watching your balances decline during a bear market. Almost everybody has a high risk tolerance when the bulls are on parade and the market's moving higher. But it's times like this that give investors a gut check of their true risk tolerance. Just understand that money in the stock market is always susceptible to declines of 50% or even more. If it's an individual stock, it might be even much more than that. How much can you tolerate that type of fluctuation? Know yourself, know what you can handle. Keep in mind, when the facts change, so should you. If you're just starting out and you don't have that much invested, perhaps a big decline like that wouldn't be catastrophic. But if you have been saving for some time and you've built up a nice nest egg, then a decline like that's going to have a bigger effect. Make sure to adjust your allocations to your current reality. You should never take on so much risk that a decline in the stock market would be catastrophic to your life. It is perfectly okay and it's actually quite advisable to stay balanced, to not have all of anything, especially once you've saved up a decent sized nest egg. Third, understand that when things look hopeless, they aren't. This too shall pass, but we don't know when. We will recover and so will the stock market but we don't know the timing. I had a professor in college at the University of Kansas that used to say, you can figure out what, but you can't figure out when. And his point was that you must give yourself enough time to recover from being wrong. And if you don't have time to recover, then maybe don't take on as much risk. My final point, don't let fear or greed push you around. Don't let the fear of missing out, another way of saying greed, push you into taking on more risk than you can really live with. Also, don't let fear of market losses turn you into something that you're not. It's a common temptation to want to jump out of the market once it has dropped a considerable amount, thinking that you're going to buy back lower. While I'm not saying that it can't be done, understand that most people, including professional investors, are terrible at doing this. I mean, let's think about it for a minute. If you're getting out of the market because you're scared of losing more money after it's already dropped, well then fear has already overtaken the market. Understand that buying lower means buying when the fear is higher. What makes you think that you're the run into a burning building type of investor that's going to buy when the fear is even higher? Be honest with yourself. Are you more likely to buy when things settle down? Well, when things settle down, that typically means when prices are higher. If you didn't think to take the chips off the table when the market was much higher, perhaps you won't think to put those chips back in when the market is lower. So know yourself. Study after study has shown that most investors that jump in and out of markets, they tend to underperform those who leave their investments alone for extended periods or systematically rebalance their portfolios periodically. Now, if you're a professional trader that has studied the short-term fluctuations and you know what you're doing, more power to you. But understand, that is a highly specialized skill 
that most people fail at doing even after studying for years and years and having years and years of trial and error. On the other hand, millions of individuals with no specialized training have been very successful investors by sticking to a balanced plan of investing in balanced portfolios and then rebalancing systematically as markets fluctuate. None of us know what will happen next, so it's important to control what we can control. We can't control the markets and we can't control the economy, but we can control how we prepare for both the bad times as well as the good times. If history is any judge, this too shall pass and the markets will bottom before any belie anybody believes that it makes sense for that to happen. Bull markets are born on pessimism. When the last sellers have thrown in the towel, that's actually when the recovery begins. I do believe we will recover, and just like our grandparents and our great-grandparents learned life-changing lessons from their experiences, so will we. My great-grandparents were products of the Dust Bowl era in Kansas, and they never forgot those lessons. In fact, they taught them to my grandparents, who were products of the World War II era, who then taught those lessons to my parents. And I believe that all of us will learn from what we're living through right now, and so will our kids. And then they'll teach these lessons to our grandchildren. I believe that the recovery, when it happens, it'll be filled with a renewed sense of purpose, just as it has in the past. I think that we'll see new urgency to protect our local critical industries, to take care of what we have, and to make our own medicines, to build our own stuff, and to do it with the latest technology so that we'll do it cleaner and more efficiently than ever before. I believe it will happen, but I can't tell you when. With that, let me close by summarizing what we've covered today. Talk to your kids about money and how much things cost. Teach them to save for a rainy day. And talk about the businesses you see as you go about your lives. As you talk about the businesses you see, remember, anyone with money can buy shares of publicly traded companies. When you start to look at companies, remember, stocks follow earnings, aka company profits. Look for companies that you wish you could own. But always remember, money in the market is money at risk. It's important to know yourself, know your situation, and understand how much risk you can handle. No matter what, your first investment should always be your emergency reserve. We recommend at least three to six months of your monthly expenses in a cash reserve. And no matter what, don't let fear or greed push you into decisions that you'd rather not make. Thank you so much for listening to me today. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me at jj at teachingkidstobuystocks.com. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, just a quick little update here while I'm getting up the next uh, talk. Uh, we have the speaker actually on the live chat with us, so go ahead and you can ask any of your questions to Keisha. Keisha, I'm so tired I can't read straight. <laughs> um, and uh, awesome. Oh yeah, well we have a lot of great talks. I'm so glad all uh, everyone's jumping on and being here to answer questions for everybody. And uh, I just wanted to note also one more thing. I know we have a lot of giveaways going on, so I, I'm going to be posting up like one max, all the info about all the giveaways for today graphic um, before the end of the day up on the Facebook page. So let me get this file up and going here. I'm having a little trouble starting it, so we'll be right there. Hello everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I want to welcome you guys to the confidence.
We're getting you up, honey. All right, the audio started before you were ready. Okay. And again, we want to make sure to say thank you to all of our speakers and our vendors for putting together such a great lineup for us and being so generous with the giveaways as well. So let's get the Confident Child started. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I want to welcome you guys to the Confident Child workshop workshop session. I am super excited to be able to come in here and just pour into you parents, um, especially with everything going on. I'm glad that we're having an opportunity to be able to still connect, maybe not in the way that we're wanting to, um, but connect a little bit um, so that we're able to still pour into each other and pour into our youth and your children. I <clears throat> In this Confident Child Workshop, my intention is for you guys to be able to gain some knowledge, some skills, so that you're able to connect with your child in a different type of way, okay? So, you're probably wondering, who am I? What do I think I know about? What Confident Child, what are you talking about? Well, let me introduce myself. My name is Keisha Montfleury, and I am a confidence coach. I normally um, work with our young girls, but I have a passionate for our youth. I have my bachelor's degree in child human development, and I have 16 years experience working with our youth and our families. And it's some the social emotional health of our children. That is something that I'm passionate about. And that's something that I'm always talking about. And I'm always excited to be able to share with parents different ways that they're able to connect with their child. So during this session, you are going to look, we're going to talk about three ways that you are able to support your child in a confident way for you and for them to be able to build a healthy confidence. When I am talking about confidence, I'm not talking about cockiness. I'm not talking about all those um, negative connotations that come along with it. I'm talking about a healthy confidence. And I want you guys to know that, it, do you guys know that if a child is not confident, if a child has a low self-esteem, it will affect different areas in their lives. It will affect their relationships that they have. And not only romantic relationships, if you have older children, but friendships that they may have, um, relationship with their siblings and relationships that they have with you. And we want to make sure that they have that strong foundation of a healthy friendship um, and relationship with self also. Um, so we want to make sure that they have a healthy, strong foundation so that as they're getting older, they're navigating through different types of relationships that they are able to confidently, and I mean confidently, healthy confidence um, to be able to um, manage future relationships. Okay. So I believe that I believe that that starts with as young as five years old. I love working with my school agers. I love working with my, um, I work with elementary school, middle school and high school because they all have something different that they are, um, that they are needing and different ways of communicating with them. Um, so whatever age your child is, this will definitely help in that process. Another thing that I wanted to share is that this is near and dear to me and important to me because I myself participated in unhealthy relationships due to a low self-esteem. So it wasn't until um, literally one day, my daughter, she was about six or seven at the time, she was staring at herself, stare, staring at herself in the mirror, and I'm staring at her, staring at herself, and I decided to ask her, what do you see when you look in there? She turned and she pointed to me, you guys. I was not proud of the woman that she was pointing at. So that is when I made it my life's mission, my purpose to plant the seeds of encouragement into our youth so that we are, so that they are not given into negative behaviors. They are not given into peer pressure. They are not given into, um, into settling. So we want to make sure that um, we are pouring into them and that we are planting those seeds of encouragement. And I am, like I said, going to share those different ways that we can do that. So are you ready? Are you ready to join me on this process? Okay, here we go. Here we go. I'm sorry. So there are five 
foundations um, of confidence that I always talk about and that I want to make sure that we understand before we move further. So these are the five keys that I believe that we're needing in order to be able to have the healthy confidence, not only for our children, but for ourselves also. Um, so remember I said that it, um, I was... My daughter is the one that reminded me of that. And these are the keys that I'm always learning and I'm always practicing so that I'm able to be the most healthiest version of myself. So those five things are purpose. And you're wondering like, what is that? What, what does that have to do with anything? I believe that when you know that you have a purpose on this earth, when you know that you are you were put on here to be able to serve others and to be able to do something that you were gifted to do, that you start to walk in a different type of way. So I believe that we all have a purpose on this earth. We all have give you wonder what what that might be, right? Has anybody ever asked you that? So what I mean by purpose is that we all have gifts talents and skills and when we get a gift is something that comes naturally to you a uh, talent is something that <clears throat> you are passionate about, but it does take a little bit of practicing and a skill is something that, that comes easily to you. So when you think about your gifts, your talents and your skills, you marry that together. And I believe that's when purpose comes into place. Okay. So that is number one is that we have a purpose. You have a purpose. Your child has a purpose. I have a purpose and I'm walking in it. Okay. Number two is that self care does matter. I know that we're seeing that a lot online um, about self-care and what that can look like, but I want to make sure that when we're talking about self-care, we're not talking about surface level self-care. We're talking about deep rooted self-care. I'm going to tell you the meaning of self-care. What it means for me is that the act of practicing, um, and practicing and protecting one's own well-being. Come on, you guys. When that, have you heard, you heard that? I'm going to say it one more time. The act of practicing protecting one's own well-being. What that means to me is that I am going to have to take an active role into practicing self-care. And that's going to look different for you than it's going to look different for me um, and for your child. So there's different ways that you can um, start practicing those skills. Do you notice um, maybe that your child, um, maybe the time of day that you have them doing homework might not be the best time of day for them. They might need a nap, even though they're a little bit older or whatever the case may be. Me, that's something for me. I need a nap. It boosts me. Um, it is the self care is not only physical, making sure that you know you're caring for yourself in that type of way, but I like to share with the kids that we have a shell. And what our shell is, your outside being, we do have to take care of ourselves so that I believe that when you look good, you feel good. So that is a part of self-care. So that's going to look different for you than it's going to look different for your child than it's going to look different for me. Okay. So I want you guys to really think about that. Number three is that we are all on a journey. We're all on a journey. And when I pulled up the meaning of journey, journey means to travel, to go, to move from one place to another. What do you think that means? Guys, the first thing that came to mind is that it's an action word. We are on a journey and it's going the same way that self-care is going to look different, the same way that purpose is going to look different, that journey is going to look different for you and your child, okay? Um, and then I like to break it up into two, which is exercising our bodies and um, wanting to have the desire to travel. Now, you guys know we're stuck right now, so um, traveling um, is very limited, but that doesn't give us the, um, we shouldn't stop right there. We can research the places that are interesting to us. We can have our child, ask our child, where would they like to go? I wanna ask you something. If I gave you a ticket to go anywhere, where would you go? How would you get there? What would that look like? Why do you want to go there? What is the weather like? What am I going to have to wear? What am I going to have to pack? What kind of foods are there um, that's of interest to me? Now, I want you guys to really think about that and ask your children. You will be um, surprised by some of the answers that they come up with. 
So um, that's journey. Number four is health and nutrition does matter. This is definitely a time that you can um, pour into your children in a different type of way. You can allow them to be able to um, look at recipes. You guys can look at recipes together. What can you add to some of your favorite things? What can you take away? You want to make sure that you're a, that as you're researching, you're looking at some of the benefits. And it's okay. Like I said, I'm not trying to tell anybody to go vegan or vegetarian or you don't have to go to that extreme but we want to be mindful with the things that we are putting inside of our bodies so i want you guys to really think about that and give your child a chance to be able to contribute to the meal okay last but not least is investment and i leave that <clears throat> lastly because one thing that comes to your mind probably is money. And yes, that is a part of investment and that's very important how we manage our money. And that's why you're here. That's why you're here, right? Um, and then the other thing with investment for me is how are we spending our time? How we take, how are we taking care of ourselves and how are we spending time with people that we have, that we love and um, that we have in our lives? And guess what? A part of investing is you being here right now, right here, taking advantage advantage of the things that you have set out for your child and for yourself, okay? So I am super proud of you um, for coming on here and for taking the time to listen to um, all these different um, ways that you're able to connect and support your child, okay? So back to the five keys is purpose, self-care, journey, health and nutrition and investment. So when I'm talking about confidence and the foundation of it, that is what I am talking about, you guys. So in our time together, like I said, we're going to learn ways that you can support your children with the skills necessary to being confident in all areas of their lives. Remember, we talked about that with those five keys. Supporting our children and making sure that they do not give in easily to peer pressure. When you are having a healthy confidence, when you are walking in your purpose, when you are caring for yourself, that's going to look so different, you guys, that they're not even going to be bothered by someone trying to peer pressure them um, and then <clears throat> to be confident when expressing their values and beliefs we want our ch children to be able to speak up for what they believe in right so that is what um, these skills are going to do so usually my workshops are very interactive and it's meant to challenge you in a healthy way okay so i want you guys to um to ask as answer the questions ask yourself ponder speak back to the uh, speak back to the screen if you need to but um like i said it's meant to be um interactive so ready for tip number one okay there's gonna be three tips Tip number one is spend intentional time. First thought might be, who's got time to be doing all that? That is okay. That's okay. I want to let you guys know, when you are spending intentional time with their child, you are showing them three things. You are showing them, number one, that they matter. Number two, how important it is to invest in others. And then number three, it gives your child a safe place to connect, okay? So I want you guys to think about that. I'm going to say that again. And number one, it shows them that they matter. The fact that you are making the time to be able to spend with your child, think about how that might feel, especially if you have more than one children. Would um, now that we are limited to what we can be doing, to what to to traveling outside of you know um, getting your essentials and your necessities. I want you guys to think of creative ways that you're able to connect with your children. Can you go to the car just for you know? I know they have drive-through services and different things. I'm um, still open. Can you go to their a quick little um, drive-through spot, get a quick little burrito or something, sit in the car and talk with your child? Um, is that something that you can do? Can you make their favorite meal and maybe go to another part of the room to connect with them? When I mean connect, I'm talking about having a one-on-one -on -one with your child. 
That is when you're investing in them, showing them, like I said, that they matter, showing them the importance of investing because you're investing your time to make sure that you're listening to them. And then this gives your child to be able to have a safe space to connect with you. I want to share that with you because especially now with um, being pretty much locked in, um, we want to ask our children some questions about what they think is going on. And they might not be able, they might not be comfortable doing it in front of everybody or their other siblings. But if you make the time, you might get a conversation from them that you might not have had if you haven't had that one on time, <clears throat> one on one time. Okay. So I would like to share some ideas. <clears throat> I'm sorry, guys. I would like to sh like to share some ideas with you guys on um, to challenge you guys to do this. So I want you to think about three things. What comes to your mind when you think about this? Like I said, with the ideas given, what comes to your mind? What are some of the challenges that come up for you doing this, during this? And I know there's a lot. I've had to think outside the box also. And then how can you, how can we support you as a community? And how can you find support from other people in your life? And these are some of the ways that you're able to um, practice self-care or do some things with them. You can build a self-care kit with them right? Whatever that might look like for you guys. Um, you can schedule one-on-one -on -one time with them by putting it in your calendar. You want, I know for me, I'll say yes to things, but if it's not in the calendar, I um, will forget. And I know you're probably wondering like, is it that serious? But some, yes, it's showing your child. I'm telling you that, um, the investment that you're making in them and have them, um, along in that process. Set a time where, where where there will be no electronics while you guys are connecting. So when you guys are connecting, you're talking face to face. You're having a conversation with your child. Um, it might seem a little um, awkward at first, but um, it, once you start doing it a little bit more, then it will become something that your child is used to and look forward to. Okay, so no electronics. Pick one day out of the week to play a board game or card games with each other. This can be something, like I said, that you um, you guys can be doing, um, especially one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I know my, that's something that my daughter loves to do. Um, you can look up Would You Rather questions for teens, for kids edition. Um, that's something that I really love to do too and love to be able to hear the answer. Um, and then once a month, you can go to your favorite restaurant with a fam family member and that's something when, you know, things start to open back up, then that's something that you can take into consideration, okay? So that was our first one was spending intentional time, okay? So I want to ask you, now that you know, now that you have ideas, how are you going to spend time with your child? Take a second to think about it, okay? Okay. Number two, tip number two is to invest in something that they are interested in. Want to know how you're going to find out what he or she is interested in? Yep, you guessed it, by spending intentional time with them. Spending intentional time with your child will bring so much conversation Um <clears throat> Like I said, you might it might be a little bit awkward at first, but this is a time for you guys to be able to talk to each other. And then once you start asking questions, like the would you rather questions or question funny questions, then it brings up conversation. Then you can start talking about and asking for things that they like, things that they don't like, um, things that they've always wanted to do. And that's how you're able to gain more information so that you're able to maybe surprise them and do things that they're interested in so that they're not feeling like is spending time is boring or spending time is something that they have to do but it's something that they look forward to okay so like I said if you're um, investing in something that they're interested in and the way you're gonna find that out is by in spending intentional time okay so I'm going to ask you again when I when we're talking about tip number two what comes to mind when you think about this? What comes to mind, you guys? What are some challenges that may come up for you? And how can we support 
or your community um, around you support you in this time. Okay. So here are some examples that I want to give you guys. So is your child into sports, into a particular sport? Maybe you guys can go in the backyard, play soccer together, play basketball together, whatever that looks like for you. Like I said, it might be awkward because I know my son plays basketball. So if I'm asking him to play basketball, he's going to look me up and down at first. But I'm telling you, it's worth the try. Okay. Um, maybe you can make time by watching their favorite game with them, watching, um, playing their favorite video game. I know we said no electronics, but this is a way to be able to do things that interest them. So besides the one-on-one, -on -one, if you're noticing the video games and you're wondering like, why are they so enamored in that video game? That's a way that you're able to connect with them in that way. Okay. Is your child into music? Um, this is a chance for you to be able to see what they're listening to. Um, ask them questions about it. Um, don't bombard them too much because, you know, music is for them to enjoy. But um, it's a way for you to stay interested in and what they have going on. What are their favorite artists? Why do they like the, the music that they're listening to? Why do they like the artists? Do they have a favorite artist? Um, and are they into drawing or painting? How can you sit down and um, color with them or do something with them? But it has to be intentional, um, spending time with something that they're interested in. That's how you're able to have them to start opening up also. Okay? So, question. How are you going to invest in your child? Okay? I'm going to let you guys think about that for a little bit while we go into tip number three. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Here goes. Tip number three is to affirm your child. Okay. If you haven't heard that, or if you have not, um, if you don't even do it for yourself or for, you're not used to that, I'm going to give you some tips. Okay. So did you know that in the year 2020, which we're in, the World Health Organization predicts that mental health problems in children will increase by 50%, you guys. Will increase, and we are in the year 2020. And I can see, I pulled this up about a couple years ago, and when I seen this, I was like, whoa. And now I see, because of everything that's going on, that can bring up different types of challenges for our children. So... But we are meant to be able to support and to combat against that for our child if, if we can, okay? So when she, for me, an affirmation means a statement, an oath, something that we are um, stating about our child, okay? Um, when he or she goes out into the world, they may be facing things such as bullying, negative assumptions or perceptions, fake friends, etc. Okay. And that to me, the best way that I can put this is think about a bank account, right? When you have a bank account, when you're putting money in there, your account is growing, right? It's growing. It, 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 it's getting full. You, you like to see that. Um, but if you do not put money in there and you try to pull money out, what happens? What happens? You can't withdraw you can't withdraw something that's not in there, right? And that is what I think about when we think about our kids. When you are pouring into them, when you are affirming them, letting them know how much you appreciate them, how much you care about them, that you love them, they are full. They're they're being deposited <clears throat> with um love from you. When they're walking out there, it, they are going to get <clears throat> <clears throat> negativity, whether we like it or not, that's just the world and how it is. You're not, not everyone is going to, <clears throat> to affirm them and be excited to see them. They're going to face adversity. That's going to happen. We want to make sure that we are supporting them in the way that we can. And, um, if you are affirming your child and spending time with them and doing things, <clears throat> making that time to invest in them, they will not so easily succumb to the things that, um, the negative things that people are trying to throw at them. So, 
um, there will be full with those affirmations and remembering that you love them and that you care about them and it won't hurt as much. It may hurt still, but it won't hurt as much. But if they are not getting that, if they're not getting affirmed at home, they're not feeling secure at home, then when they go out there and then they're getting <clears throat> um, harassed or negativity or bullying, then it's going to hurt much more because they, um, they don't have anything to offset that. So I want to just, um, let you guys know tip number three is very important. Um, and, um, it's a way for you to be able to connect and pour into your child. And that way, so that they are not given into, you know, the negative behavior, the bullying, and it's not affecting them as much. Okay. So what comes to mind when you think about this? You know, I'm going to ask, what are some of the challenges that come up for you? And then how can we support you in, in this? What kind of support are you needing? Are you needing resources? Um, so for me, I want to give a little bit more tips when it comes to the affirmation is I want to encourage you to base your affirmation based off of things that they are genuinely battling with. We can tell them that they're beautiful. We can tell them that we love them. They're going to receive that and that's great. But what are some things that you notice that your child is saying? Are they saying that they're dumb? Are they saying that they feel like they don't matter? Well, that's what your one-on-one -on -one is for. Maybe some of the concerns that they may have. That's when you come in and you combat against that. You let them know that you do matter. Your voice matters in this household. You are not dumb. You are smart. You know, so you want to make sure that it's things that they are battling with. You want to combat against that with the intentional affirmations. So self-doubt or any negative things that they're feeling about themselves and like I said, this can be something that you notice when you're speaking with them. Um, a good example is you hear your child repeatedly saying, no one listens to me, and you remind them that their voice does matter, okay? So I'll just give you a tip to write a few affirmations about your child and speak of a couple of them daily, um, a couple times out of the day if you need to, okay? So... Those are the three tips that I wanted to share with you guys. And remember what we said is number tip number one is spending intentional time. Tip number two is investing in something that they are interested in. Tip number three is to affirm your child. And after each of those, I want you to ask yourself what comes to mind when you think about this? What are some challenges that come up for you and how can we support you? Okay, or how can your community support you? And then remember when we're talking about the foundation of a healthy confidence, we're talking about purpose, reminding you that you and your child, you guys have a purpose. Self care does matter. We are all on a journey. Health and nutrition is very important and we need to take the time to invest in ourselves and others. And that is something that you guys are doing and that I am so I'm proud of. Now, I'm going to just share my contact information just in case you would like to contact me with anything. Um, my name is Keisha Montfleury, as I stated earlier. I am known for um, being a confidence coach for girls. I'm a children's book author. I am a um, mentor. Um, you can reach me at my name is Keisha Montfleury at gmail.com or on my social media handles at Confident Keisha. So I hope that this helped. I am so proud of you for making it through. And I really appreciate the time that we were able to spend with each other. Okay. All right. We'll talk soon. Enjoy. Bye.
Hi, my name is Willie Morales with WM Music Lessons, and I wanted to thank you for watching today's workshop. The title of today's workshop is The Benefits of Music Lessons. Before we begin, I'd like to show you a video. WM Music Lessons offers services throughout Southern California. In order to reach more families, in 2017, we added virtual lessons. Let's begin our workshop. I can relate from personal experience on the benefits of music lessons. My guitar instructor, Mark, is still one of my good friends to this day. I began taking lessons at the age of 15. What makes WM Music Lessons special are our instructors. They love what they do and instill a passion for music into our students. They're not just uh, show up and take off, come back next week. They're people that pour into our kids throughout uh, our life and our years. So. That's something that uh, we really appreciate. We really appreciate WM Music. Um, I just see how Willie has been investing so much time and effort and love into our daughter Marie by just building her up and giving her that confidence for playing. She's kind of like the big sister that they don't have. When I am falling short, she's just very kind to us, and she, like you said, she feels like a bigger sister to us. So. Uh, yeah, I love her, and I probably wouldn't ask for any other music teacher. <laughs> Our girls have gone from not knowing any music and not knowing how to play any instrument to learning the basics of music. I think I kind of you know. Now they've really transitioned to where, even without us asking, they'll go just sit down at the piano and practice and enjoy playing. And I think they've just learned to love music which is more than anything that what we've wanted to get out of this. And so it's been a lot of fun for us and we love WM and it's, it's been a great uh, experience for us. Take everything from piano, voice, ukulele, uh, acoustic, electric, and bass. What stands out most for us, I think, with um, WM Music Lessons are the instructors and just their patience and the love for our kids. We've been with WM Music Lessons for about five years now and we've had several uh, instructors and all of them just show just a deep compassion and love and just encouragement for our kids and it just makes them want to come back um, each week and for each lesson and they just appreciate all that their instructors do for them. The first benefit of music lessons is that your child's self-confidence will grow. Nothing brings more joy to our hearts as music instructors than seeing our students excel as they learn their instrument because it's gonna help their self-confidence. Matthew has particularly grown a lot in his confidence level. He started um, ukulele and he did not like it at all. He was like, I just don't wanna do this. Um, and it challenged him, which is what we wanted because he's really bright and things come really easily to him and um, he had to work hard at it and we wanted that for him. And so his confidence level has just grown tremendously. He could just um, pick up the ukulele and say, oh yeah, I know how to do this. And he's not intimidated by um, anything new that he has to learn. What I like about music lessons is they help you be more confident and they help you mem with memory. 
What I like about music lessons is that the tips they give you to improve your music and that they encourage you to keep practicing so you get better and just the help that they provide you. Music lessons develop the skills that provide a firm foundation for learning. Studies have shown that students who take music lessons improve reading skills, vocabulary, and language ability. They also develop listening skills, oral awareness, abstract thinking, and imagination. Music lessons increase memory skills. They build concentration and attention span. They also build social skills, self-discipline, patience, and improve behavior. Now, piano students particularly develop fine motor skills needed for writing. Here's one that you like. Students who take music lessons score higher on SAT, writing, math, and science, and have higher grades in general. Now I've been teaching for over 20 years now, and one of the things that I've really enjoyed over that time is watching my students not only learn how to play, let's say the guitar, or the piano, the ukulele, but take what they've learned and those skills and apply them to, let's say, a band, or to being in the youth group at their church, or coming to work for WM Music Lessons. We currently have a couple of my students, my former students, who now work for our company and are passing on those life skills now to their students. Now, I just read off a wonderful list of skills and benefits that your child or children will achieve as they take music lessons. The homeschool community has been such a wonderful part of WM Music Lessons. Over the years, my wife and I, who, by the way, homeschool our kids, there you go, we've met so many wonderful families. And as our children grow up with their children, we've been able to see these kids not just learn how to play the piano, the guitar, the ukulele, or violin, but they've been able to take those skills, those life skills, into adulthood to then become well-rounded individuals. Hi, my name is Leilani. I play guitar and sing, and I've been playing for about five years, and I've worked with Willie, Angie, and Sammy. They've all been great. They've all just, you know, engaged with their students and with me on like a personal level. They've always just been there supporting, not just as a teacher, but as a friend. I'm excited to see where, you know, my musical talents take me and where I get to, you know, where it leads me and where it, how I can bless other people with my music. So I'm really excited and I'm grateful that I've had those teachers to encourage me along the way. We would love to come alongside and help you develop the skills that we just discussed in the lives of your children through music lessons. So whether you live in the area surrounding Southern California, Northern, Central, or maybe even San Diego, or you live out of state, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, anywhere you live, our instructors can work with your family through virtual lessons. If you're interested in music lessons through WM, visit our website, wmmusiclessons.com, or you can go to our Instagram or Facebook page. They're both called WM Music Lessons. Sign up today.
Thank you so much for tuning in to today's workshop. We look forward to working with your family. All right, everybody. I have to say, I'm loving seeing all these posts from everyone with their favorite games and their kids doing the Tinker the Robot Challenge. So keep them coming, you guys. It's just, it's so wonderful to see all these kids getting active and participating in these really fun educational activities and also just being involved. And, and uh, so next up, we have an interview with Marty, who is a financial consultant here get everything going for you guys and we're gonna be talking about uh, you need to know your money to grow your money hi everyone thanks for joining us today I'm here with Marty Marty say hi hi everybody this is exciting yeah and so Marty explain like who you are where you're from what's going on yeah, I'm Marty Rogers. I'm a wealth creation, wealth protection advocate. I'm in San Jose, California, and I'm licensed throughout the country. I'm just really glad that we're doing this today because we're going to talk about some powerful. Yeah, so today we're actually going to be talking about, uh, or you're going to be telling us about a talk based on how people can need to know their money before they can start to grow their money, right? Exactly. So tell us more about like what that is and what and what kind of are the main notes for this talk. So Grace, basically, you know, I basically want to start by calling it out, you know, the situation that most people are in. Mm -hmm. And this is no judgment. It's just, you know, reality. And it's no it's not our fault. But I want to empower people to have a financial understanding. And that's the approach yes. I take, you know. And wouldn't you agree that most of us, in society are living with too much debt there's so much debt i think the national i i've actually stopped keeping track of the national debt because it does fluctuate but it's it's somewhere i think in like the trillions it's it usually, is it's about, usually 23, the of trillions. about 23 tr trillion yeah oh, it's just yeah i mean if you divide that by the population it's still like even though we have a large population in the u.s it is still a massive amount mm -hmm. and it's it's just detrimental. So I yeah. think, yeah, that's everyone's... just a lot of downward pressure, right? Yeah. So that downward pressure is impacted by not understanding how to get out of it and getting into it wasn't necessarily even intentional. It was basically a lack of financial understanding, financial um, empowerment. And um, I want to kind of pull back the curtain on that you know, those yeah. three enemies that we're going to talk about. And then, you know, it only makes sense if I talk about those enemies, it definitely makes sense to talk about some bullet points of how to get out of it. Oh, yeah, I think definitely people, a lot of people understand that they don't have necessarily the financial education or understanding. I mean, we, we both kind of deal with that. But being able to not just know that you have a problem, which is kind of like the, um, I'm, I'm right. hearing myself and I'm like, I'm going into how you deal with an addiction or how right. you deal with a problem. Once you have to identify the problem before you can start to fix it. And that, that goes for any field, whether, you know, it's, it's finance or anything else. So what would you say are the, the, the main issues, you know, besides people not knowing that or not being financially educated, is there any other one right. like that's a big one for you? Absolutely. So like you, like I was saying, you know, number one would be, there are like three main ones. I would say number one would be lack of financial education, right? And when there's a lack of understanding, there's a lack of, you know, focus, but I'd say the second part would be there's a lack of discipline. Oh, yeah. You know, because if you don't understand it, how can you be aware of having the discipline? And like maybe even a system, right? Yeah. And then with a lack of a lack of awareness, a lack of discipline leads to poor decision making. You know, for example, you know if you know, I know that you're in education, thank thank goodness for that, and you want to empower young young people, you know, and their parents want to have access, and we're craving it, right? Yes. It's kind of hard to even articulate it. And it maybe correct me if I'm 
wrong, but it comes out with like, do you have anything for me? Do you have anything for us? I hear that and, all the time. It's the number one this thing parents quiet, say. There's this quiet suffering on the under underground, and it's it's very um, overwhelming. And so yeah. people don't know what to do, how how to do it, and even why, you know. And all these moving parts um, just kind of leads to more overwhelm and there's a big price that's being paid for that too there is and it's it's also not just a price with the parents it becomes a, a generational price which you know the kids are being affected by seeing their parents and that last and i i know that you know when we've talked before you you've talked about uh generational wealth and there's also i mean there's finances whether it's good or bad like there there's a generational impact on that so it's not mm -hmm. just yourself and, you know, and everybody has their own interpretation of wealth you know yeah wealth could be mean like you know what i just kind of kept everything afloat this month and i'm not feeling like this anxiety that's yeah. that's huge you know um now that could be a powerful building block too right mm -hmm. and, and so yeah to to absolutely <laughs> so absolutely so if i were to say you know one two or three it would be lack of understanding because of not educated or guided that leads to poor decision making which results in um you know lack of the the discipline and then lack of good decision making because our thoughts are kind of scattered we grow up we go to school we're taught go get a good job or that was the traditional model yes um, we know that that's traditional but sometimes we know into intuitively that that's not going to be the answer but going to college, you know, is is something very powerful and wonderful. But what it does is it misses that target of, you know, keeping people on track. And that leads to student loan debt and um, then having to, when they get the job, you know, they have to borrow money because they're already in debt. It's just compounding that that problem even more. Yes, exactly. So it, it becomes what seems out of control. So, I mean, we've identified the the problems, the three main problems of the lack of financial awareness, and the, the lack of discipline, and poor decision making that can seriously detrimentally detrimentally affect both you know your financial situation as well as you know then your children's financial situation and right. also be a detriment to being able to teach your children to make better financial decisions and a better financial future because we all know we want our kids to do better so absolutely so is there any uh like one or two like tips or, or things that you have identified that can really help parents and, and what it is that they need to do or yes. something like that absolutely and you know this isn't something that happens overnight but you know Three bullet points I'll just say right here is we want to understand that it's important to make money, to know how to make it, right? Yes. The second step is when you make money, you want to keep it. You want to consistently have a habit of saving it, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how small it is as long as it's consistent, okay? Yeah. Because a lot of people go, well, how much is it? It's like, you know what, let's focus on what you can and, you know, commit to what you can do. So you can set yourself up with, you know, the confidence, self-esteem of like, hey, I'm being loyal to something for myself, right? Yeah. And then gradually you're going to want to increase that. And that consistency is going to help you define and have that a very established habit. And then you want to grow it. Okay. Awesome. Now, there's much more ways. I mean, we can kind of get a little bit more involved and some mm -hmm. people have, you know, issues with you know, debt, that's the area to kind of get out of the way. And there's some strategies, there's some, some plans that could be put in place if it's, um, if, if it's suitable for the person, of course. Yeah. And, you know, just taking that heavy weight off their, off their back, you know, they realize just how much it was burdening them. So imagine if you could start, you know, to implement a strategy where, 30 to 50% of your debt is like lifted, you know, wow, to start that would... like putting money back in, into your pocket. Right. Yeah. 
So and I love that those two kind of feed into each other, both making making money and you know making sure that you keep it. Because obviously, if someone has a, a large amount of debt, they're trying to pay down. They're they're not keeping their money. It's it's going toward this. Exactly. But if you exactly. reduce that, even by like even a quarter, like I can't imagine there are probably so many people out there that could just do so much with that money and it would put them ahead so much to be able to have a little bit more money at the end of the month um, to either, you know, go towards savings or maybe like their kids' mm-hmm. college funds or, or even to, and I did, you did mention it to, to growing their money to maybe like an investment or something just to get, just to get started. Yeah, just to start it. And you know yeah. what, our, our investments, depending on where they are and what they are, they're treated differently when it comes to taxes. So understanding how yeah. how money grows, how money gets taxed, you know, and it's it's a very um, empowering, you know, shift, which also brings to the table the importance of mindset, mm. money mindset, and you know, our identity determines like what we feel we deserve. So the habits and the mindset really do go hand in hand. I love that like everything keeps circling back around to each other. Like, you you know, to be able to grow your money, to keep your money and grow your money, you have to understand you know, finance, a little bit more about financial education, about yourself and your mm-hmm. habits so that, you know, you don't make the bad decisions so that you can keep more of your money so that you can grow. Like it all just, yeah. oh, I love And that. then knowing what those simple fun- fundamentals are. It's like, well, now I know how and where to even put it like what to even do with it what to even expect right yeah so each one of us needs to have like that vision that you know that uh picture in our mind of where we're going right like well how much do i need what do i need you know a year from now five years ten years but really if we could start moving some blockades that are right here in front of us by you know seeing a a a visual or feeling it and going i see how my debt's going to come down and in three years i'll be debt free you know yeah. for example. that's one client i worked with that would be yeah. so awesome for so many people so i'm Absolutely. hearing you say like these kind of action items and i can almost hear the parents like just yelling it at me like what can we do like specifically like because you know people need that clarity. Yes. and i'm hearing you talk about like debt reduction or even like just debt awareness and um and, you know, being aware of your habits as well. Yes. yes, absolutely. And, you know, some people don't realize the impact that the debt may be happening. Happening. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying all debt is bad. And knowing how to leverage it in your favor is yes. key, right? So I'm not going to... Right back know, to that financial education. That, but, <laughs> you know, some people can be making a lot of money and they have debt, but their income is addressing the debt. For the time being right yeah. and we know that debt compounds right so bad habits will compound good habits will as well okay well, i think that's that probably is just an amazing nugget right there that parents need to keep in head that in their minds that not only do your bad habits have lot long lasting effects but so do your good habits and so it's not just enough to be aware of what you're doing you know as far as your habits but also to try to change those toward the more positive I think that goes with children too. Like, absolutely. You know, teacher, so, have good habits. You know, you know, I just want to paint a picture of hope here. So, as 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 adults, we're just going, oh my gosh, it can be overwhelming. But when we have, you know, our whys in front of us every day, you know, we before we fall asleep, we're thinking about them, right? Our yeah. children or our students or you know, the people in life. Keep going. I mean, I mean, yeah. I I love I love people. I just always have. So. If I feel like there's a injustice that needs to be corrected, I will, you know, I will be laser focused on that, right? So helping people become aware of it and helping them become equipped, you know? Yes. So that is that is really, really key. And I just love witnessing that shift, that even sensing that that energetic shift mm-hmm. when people feel like, you know what? I already feel the hope of what it's going to be like to be out of this situation and I'm not out of it. I already know that they're feeling it. And it's just one of those things that um, I want as many people as possible to have that. Yeah. And I can say just out of, the hope. Um, the hope. yeah, out of my personal experience. And one of the reasons why I really wanted you to be a part of this Marty was because that 
Um, and we knew each other for a while before this happened, but I had, and everyone who's seen me at an event knows that there was a time when my husband was unemployed and it, like, it felt like the world was crashing down on us. Just, I, you know, I've been there <laughs> more than once, not happy about that, but uh, I, one of the things I did was we, we spoke and Marty is just this beacon of hope where, you know, she's there to answer your questions. So I want to make sure that we also make sure where people can find you. Um, even though we've got like time left, I just want to make sure you, we definitely get saying that because, you know, Marty's great at helping people. So where can people find you? So great. Thank you, Victoria. So the way people can find me is to go to my website, wfgconnects.com forward slash M Rogers. That's M R O G E R S. Awesome. And what I really wanted to get into a little bit more because we were just talking about it was that the, the, the action items and what pe- can people do. So, Well, absolutely. So I want to just emphasize that getting um, control over some understanding, the basic mm-hmm. fundamentals, because the key thing in, in here is to help people make a simple shift, transition, to start doing one powerful step for themselves, right? To get them one win. What if we could help someone start getting on track of getting out of debt? Even if that takes two and a half, three years or so, right? It's still gonna be here, right? If we can start putting money back into their pocket, right? Yeah. Increasing cash flow from that standpoint alone. Yeah. So I know, I mean, I know we kept coming back to kind of the same things and going into a little bit more in depth and it just kind of as an example because we were talking about getting control and I know we already said you know making money and, and keeping your money and being aware of your financial education or their lack of and understanding uh, or, or lacking in your discipline and, and being able to make better financial decisions and all of this kind of goes together but I mean you know and I don't have a problem talk, talking about it that one of the things that we did when me and my husband were in a not great financial situation and we were you know he was unemployed for a while was the first thing that you did was like, here's a financial like analysis, go fill it up and like, you know, figure out where you are. And that was, and, and I know it, it all falls into all those that we already mentioned, but that was critical to me to being able it to really realize. Is. I remember we talked about it and I came to you and I was like, I didn't, I, I knew that we had some debt, but I didn't realize that it was so much. <laughs> right, right. And you know what? It, it is not as scary as it may seem. Of course, I'm not going to say there's not going to be some emotions around it, but you're going to be yeah. totally safe. I'm there to guide you through it, provide feedback and a illustrated map of where you are and how I could make some suggestions of let's start to find some money that may be going in areas that don't need to be, you know, let's start to kind of re- redirect some stuff. And yeah, re-shift you know, here's the, here, here's the truth. In our minds, you know, our situation is not as great as sometimes we think it is, but it's sometimes the good news is it's not as bad. Yeah. It's not as bad because there is hope. It's like, well, we can make some, some tweaks, a few shifts. And I want people to start to really get in touch with what their hopes and dreams are again. Yeah. I think that was, (laughs) that was something we talked about. Yeah. I think that's something for sure that we stopped giving ourselves permission to do, you know? and yeah. stop, stop punishing yourself and just start you know and i think it really helps by staying out of isolation start talking about it with the Your safe person and, right yeah. someone and you feel safe spouse. with and they're, and they're and they're equipped to hide and guide you through it you know and, you know yeah and i think and that's i always tell parents to talk with their kids about money and i think it's it's important because you guys can't you know as a team you can't push in the same direction if you don't all know what's going on, which I know I, we keep coming back to this, you know, which I mean is the crux of the, of the talk here, which is to know your money and to know, you know, your position, yourself, your financial situation. Exactly. And, and yes. And, and, to, and to do including, something about including it. Including your, your uh, children yeah. along with it. You can start putting some things in place for your children while doing that for yourself at the same time. Yeah. You know? And then they'll begin to know how they make money, how they can learn to keep it, and how they can learn exactly, to grow it and be better kids, off. Exactly, because kids love this, by the way. They love, love money. this. They yeah. love money. And I want kids to feel good about that. They don't, I don't want them to feel 
bad about that. I want them to feel good. Yeah. You know? We want to have a positive correlation so they're not trying to avoid dealing with it. You know, exactly. Think as adults, That's we do avoid really dealing key with what stuff. you just said. Mm-hmm. That's really key. Absolutely. So we've got, you know, we want parents to do like a little financial checkup. Uh, do you, and I know like you do consulting, obviously, is there something before they come to you with like all their details that they can do any resources or something that you have? For Absolutely. Parents? And I want you to go to my website and at the very top of the homepage, it has a banner. It has a financial literacy test. Quite fun. Five questions. It'll give you your results and you'll start to match up, you know, what you got right, what you, what you missed. And it helps you kind of bridge the gap of understanding. You can send me a email and I will I will respond to you if you'd like to have a conversation over the phone for 15 minutes. So maybe we can identify some things that are of concern to you right now, like maybe one or two things that are concerned, what maybe your one one or two top goals are and how maybe we might be able to bridge the gap. If I can give you any suggestion, I promise you I will. Um, if Yo, I definitely will. Else, <laughs> if, I, so if, awesome. if I could, if I could direct you to uh, somebody else to help you specifically with a problem that's unique, uh, that's not in my in my bandwidth, I absolutely will. First off, I don't think I've taken that quiz, so I can't help you guys. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, that's awesome. And also, you know, I can see, you know, a lot of parents of older kids would probably, you know, you guys can take it together and see, you know, maybe you guys have different answers and, you know, compare and contrast. Who knows? Maybe your kids know more than you do. Uh, that, I was just going to say that it's revealing. I have two sons. They're both adults. And um, my oldest, he's in his early 20s. He was saying to me yesterday, I would never go into deep debt. I want to always want to keep it. And I was thinking in my mind, like, oh, good. Like, I was getting the answers to questions I was afraid to ask because those of us that have, you know, young adult kids, it's a different animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's you like. You want to know, you want to have those conversations with your kids. Yeah, it's like, have... you know, but then it's like, oh, so you do use a credit card knowing that's okay, but he's using it responsibly. I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank That's you, yeah, I mean these are these are tools. So you're like knowing, and that goes back to making those decisions. Not every path is the same for everybody. Um, actually, we ended up me and my husband personally. We fixed our situation, our, our our financial debt. We actually lowered our majority of our debt by our, our interest rates for it for about about ten percent. I think it was uh, like on average for all of the debt that we had by taking out a personal loan to pay off our credit card debt and close down those accounts. And so is it still debt? Yeah, but it's making the good decisions and being financially It's re-strategizing, like how can yeah. we re- reposition ourselves, buy extra time yeah. and re- reduce what's going out. So and you I, can- I honestly that. would never have even thought of that if we, cause I remember your form that you did with us had actually, you know, what the debt amount was and what the percentage rate was, I believe. And Mm -hmm. I would have never thought about that because the idea when you're already in debt to use more debt to help yourself seemed counterintuitive, but it was, it was thinking about those percentage rates that you and I talked about, uh, to that really helped me to strategize. And and I would have, I don't, I genuinely, um, I'm going to like get all emotional. Um, I genuinely would not have thought of and, and been able to strategize that if it wasn't for the conversations I had with you that helped me feel more in control, identify my problems, stop, you know, those bad habits like you're saying and, and really get a little bit more discipline in my life to figure out how to fix my individual situation. So I, I always recommend going to an expert because uh, it yeah. can make such a big difference for you. Uh, And one thing I wanted to bring actually back up with you, and and again, that goes into financial education and making good decisions is, you know, you said that you, if you don't have a a person, uh, if you don't, if you yourself can't help, then you know a lot of people. And one of the things that we actually, you and I talked about was uh, debt reduction, which is huge and is is a huge, makes a huge difference. So, you know, what would be, and I'm fairly sure I actually know the answer to this, but what would be the big decision that, or the big suggestion that you would make? for people uh, as far as a takeaway action with your, you know, you make it, you keep it and you grow it to be able to deal with, with their debt. Yes. Well, you know, I think, I think, you know, four important key questions to ask yourself and write this down because you know, the answers to them Mm -hmm. is to understand 
what your debt is and allocate them. I was really impressed with how you came back with such organization, <laughs> Victoria. <laughs> um, what your what your income is and what your expenses are regularly mm -hmm. and um, what you have or may need to have in your emergency fund, right? So write down your debt, write down your income, write down your mortgage or rent yeah. expenses, those things that don't really change. Um, and then emergency funding, how much you have, how much more you need, or you know, how much you need to get to, you know? So that's the best way. And they say typically we need about, you know, three months, sometimes more, but right now I think uh, a lot of reality is hitting home for a lot of people yes. and you know we just want to make sure that we're availing ourselves right so that's why working together is going to be very impactful because we want to empower children but we also want to empower the adults too so that it can synergistically kind of come together and start really making things um really things happen in a definitive way Yes, and I think that's the key right there is not to just have any of this stuff in your head, but like you said, write it down, have it definitive and clear. Yes, and so. share it with someone like myself. I'm happy to go through that with you. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just being willing to pull back that curtain. And I'm telling you, you're going like to feel a lot more. <laughs> yeah, you're going to feel a lot more re relieved and, and hope and. I, I, someone like myself, just like if, if I were in the situation, I would outsource it to another professional. Like, can you help walk me through this? Because it's way too emotional when we're looking at our own yeah. stuff. And that I go back to your mindset yeah. that you were saying before. That we're helping with someone who we, we can trust, yeah. who's licensed, who knows um, the rules. If they, I know who, who and where to go to, to double check. And to, if you need to take out loans, you know, I'll be able to help navigate that process to help you with other sources I have to see what is the best option for you. You know, sometimes yeah. people make a quick decision without consulting somebody else and they doubled or tripled their, their, their debt in doing so. So it's really important to know what sometimes your options are. it's good to have a check. Yeah. Just to you yeah. know, make sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And I do know, you know, we have a lot of people, this is going to be going up uh, publicly on, on online and there's several people from a lot of different places coming to this event. And, you know, you actually, I know that you're located in California because we met. So, but, you know, if, even if you're like somewhere on like the other side of the country, uh, re they can still reach out to you because I know that you're part of the large Absolutely. Large Absolutely. I'm licensed in multiple states, not just California. Yeah, you know, I'm licensed at the east, east, north, east coast, northwest, south, southwest. Awesome. Yeah, because I think a lot of people think that it's it's lo uh, locally restricted, and you know they. Right. For me, they for me, I'm out. licensed in multiple states. That's Absolutely. awesome. Exactly. Right. So I wanted to point it out because I know a lot of people. Yes. Like I said, you know, I'm glad you said that because sometimes I, I forget that it's important to mention that. You know, so yeah. absolutely. Can you and you know, now we have tech technology so I, I i consult with people on on uh, line as well so yeah which everyone's zooming these days because we're all stuck we're, in our we're, homes we're all zooming, <laughs> we're all zooming. Yeah, absolutely um it's really funny because i tell you i have cats and i'm surprised none of them has made tried to make an appearance but we when they run around we call it the zoomies so <laughs> oh how cute yeah. Cute. So uh, just to make sure we I want to make bring this back for parents around. Um, we've got our three enemies, our must do's and our takeaways. So I'm going to have you go ahead and recap that for us, Marty. Yeah. So recap when it comes to our our finances, really, you know, our problems stem from three enemies, which is lack of understanding. OK. And when we don't understand it or feel informed and empowered, we don't have the discipline because we don't understand what, where, or why to position our ourselves, our money, in and our mindset. Which number three leads to very poor decisions, right? And it's not intentional. It's just oh my goodness. So those are the three things that really impair us, you know. And you know, if I were to shed some light on how to begin to get out of it, you want to, you know, um, take what, what, what you make, you know, we all make, need to make money. 
and we want to keep our money. And even if it's like the minimum of what you can start with, as long as it's a habit and increasing as soon and mm -hmm. as, as frequently as possible so that you can grow, grow your money. Now, these are habits that, you know, don't transform overnight, but you're oh, going yes. to start to feel increased self-esteem, increased certainty and confidence, because what I want you to do is feel empowered to share this with your children so they can start to implement that mindset and those habits from a very young age, knowing that they need to do that. You know, I I'm, I'm feel really blessed that my dad told me when I was 19 years old, like, I want you to consistently put money aside from your job. That's when I started working. And it wasn't so much education, but being educated in the right ways. That's awesome. And again, just, you know, remind people where they can find you so that they can reach you and take your money quiz and get your thoughts. Absolutely. And so go to wfgconnects.com forward slash M Rogers. Awesome. And I'll try to put it in the, the description link. And I just wanted to remind everyone, you know, the reason that we're bringing some of these uh, people to speak for this conference is not just because it has relevant to, to homeschooling, but it's that skills that anyone can use anywhere and some expertise of a, of a trusted, trusted expert that I know into, into this so that everyone can benefit. And we are I'm so grateful that you wanted to be part of this as well, Marty. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. I'm really excited. I know we've been talking about this for a couple of years, at least. Like, we need to be doing something together. Know. You know? We're, we're going to do more together. We're going to help lots of families. And it's going to be great. And so if and anyone, like, even if you're just, you know, like, hey, maybe I should just talk to her. Like, just, you know, I, I think I'm pretty good. But, like, why? I could be better, you know. Yeah, why exactly. Not? Just reach out, you know. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate this and I'm excited about what's to come. Yay. Awesome. So that was Marty. And I really enjoyed having this interview with her. We're going to get the next video up and going for you guys. And just to keep you guys informed as to where we are, we're almost to the end of our day here. We have Jill Kel Keltner from Learning Journeys Forum talking about building student agency. You guys are going to love this. So give me a minute while I bring that up for you. And I believe Jill might still be on the chat. So you can ask her questions on the live chat. And uh, hopefully she'll be there to answer them. I know she's been on for a little while. So, oh, wrong one. Oops.
Sorry everyone, bear with me. We're having a little bit of loading issues. Clearly my computer is very confused. Hello and welcome. I'm so glad you joined me today for this workshop on student agency, empowering students to guide their own learning journeys. I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Jill Pearson Keltner. I have been working in the field of education forever, for more than 30 years, which is a little scary. Um, but I have, because I've been doing it so long, I've also been doing a lot of different things. I have worked with everybody from preschoolers to universities. I have taught in elementary, middle, and high school. Um, and I've taught in all different kinds of situations. So I've taught in five-day public schools. I have taught um, in cooperative private schools. I've taught in homeschooling charter schools. But most important of all, I have homeschooled uh, my two boys. I have two sons. One is um, a junior in college and the other is a senior in high school. So I have my last year of official homeschooling. Uh, that said, I work with homeschoolers, um, fa homeschooling families, kids and adults all the time. So uh, presently I work um, in a two-day charter school for second to fourth graders. I, I have the second to fourth grade class. I also teach biology and economics, um, as well as other sciences and social studies um, classes to high school homeschoolers and teach workshops to parents and also do research through Learning Journeys Forum, um, which is a group uh, here in San Diego, California, where I live. So um, through all that time, what I have found is, um, that I've learned a lot about uh, about homeschooling and about learning and about what works really well for kids. Um, so what I have found in in my time is that kids um, learn best. Learning is most effective. Learning is most powerful when students are engaged, when they're having a lot of fun, when they um, are excited about what they do when they're passionate about what they're doing. Um, that is something that um, whoop, really helps a lot. The other thing that I have discovered is that learning is most effective and powerful when students have choice, when they are able to say, this is what I want to learn, this is how I want to learn it, and this is when you get that, what we call buy-in, but when kids really, really are choosing to learn, um, that's when they will be um, most effective, that learning will be most effective and powerful. Um, I have also found that learning is most effective and powerful when, when students are joyful, when they're having fun, when they're excited, um, because that's when the learning sinks in, that's when they say, oh, this is, this is great. Um, so one of the things that helps bring that engagement, the choice, and the joy to learning is student agency. And what student agency does is it really empowers kids to direct their own learning so that they are choosing the path they're on, that they're making that path happen, that they are um, strongly working um, to learn and to, to follow the path that they have chosen. So uh, one of the things that is really important, I think, um, when thinking about student agency is to think about our own student agency as adults. So agency itself is the capacity to act independently according to one's choice or beliefs. So when we have the ability um, and the power to act independently, doing what we want um, because of what we believe. So we're gonna take a moment to think about um, and to consider our own experiences. So uh, if you are watching this live, there won't be a whole lot of time, but if you have a little, you can, if you have paper nearby, you're welcome to write 
you can um, also comment in the space below or just consider and think about your own experiences. So we'll just take um, just a moment first to think about a time when your agency was taken away, either by a person or um, by circumstances when you did not have agency. What happened? Um, just think about, write about, comment if you choose. Um, what happened? How did it feel? How did it affect your behavior then? How did it affect your future behavior? So take just a moment to do that. Hello and welcome. I'm so glad you joined me today for this workshop on student agency, empowering students to guide their own learning journeys. I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Jill Pearson Keltner. I have been working in the field of education forever, for more than 30 years, which is a little scary. Um, but I have, because I've been doing it so long, I've also been doing a lot of different things. I have worked with everybody from preschoolers to universities. I have taught in elementary, middle, and high school. Um, and I've taught in all different kinds of situations. So I've taught in five-day public schools. I have taught um, in cooperative private schools. I've taught in homeschooling charter schools. But most important of all, I have homeschooled uh, my two boys. I have two sons. One is um, a junior in college and the other is a senior in high school. So I have my last year of official homeschooling. Uh, that said, I work with homeschoolers, um, fa homeschooling families, kids and adults all the time. So uh, presently I work um, in a two-day charter school for second to fourth graders. I, I have the second to fourth grade class. I also teach biology and economics, um, as well as other sciences and social studies um, classes to high school homeschoolers, and teach workshops to parents and also do research through Learning Journeys Forum, um, which is a group uh, here in San Diego, California, where I live. So um, through all that time, what I have found is, um, that I've learned a lot about uh, about homeschooling and about learning and about what works really well for kids. Um, so what I have found in in my time is that kids um, learn best. Learning is most effective. Learning is most powerful when students are engaged, when they're having a lot of fun, when they um, are excited about what they do when they're passionate about what they're doing. Um, that is something that um, whoop, really helps a lot. The other thing that I have discovered is that learning is most effective and powerful when students have choice, when they are able to say, this is what I want to learn, this is how I want to learn it, and this is when you get that, what we call buy-in, but when kids really, will, really are choosing to learn, um, that's when they will be um, most effective, that learning will be most effective and powerful. Um, I have also found that learning is most effective and powerful when, when students are joyful, when they're having fun, when they're excited, um, because that's when the learning sinks in, that's when they say, oh, this is, this is great. Um, so one of the things that helps bring that engagement, the choice, and the joy to learning is student agency. And what student agency does is it really empowers kids to direct their own learning so that they are 
choosing the path they're on, that they're making that path happen, that they are um, strongly working um, to learn and to, to follow the path that they have chosen. So uh, one of the things that is really important, I think, um, when thinking about student agency is to think about our own student agency as adults. So agency itself is the capacity to act independently according to one's choice or beliefs. So when we have the ability um, and the power to act independently, doing what we want um, because of what we believe. So we're going to take a moment to think about um, and to consider our own experiences. So uh, if you are watching this live, there won't be a whole lot of time, but if you have a little, you can, if you have paper nearby, you're welcome to write. You can um, also comment in the space below or just consider and think about your own experiences. So we'll just take um, just a moment first to think about a time when your agency was taken away, either by a person, or um, by circumstances when you did not have agency. What happened? Um, just think about, write about, comment if you choose. Um, what happened? How did it feel? How did it affect your behavior then? How did it affect your future behavior? So take just a moment to do that. So now what we'll do is take a moment to consider the opposite, to think about a time you really claimed your agency. So what happened um, when you did claim your agency? How did it feel? And how did it affect your behavior at the time and your future behavior? So either take a moment, if you're watching this um, later, you can pause the video to take more time. Um, or you can comment in the space below or just consider and think about a time when you did claim your agency. So normally in the workshops that I teach, we would take this time to talk a little bit about this. Um, and you, of course, are welcome to write in the comments below. I'd love to hear what thoughts you had. Um, normally what people find is that um, when we lose our agency, when our agency is taken away, um, we feel helpless and we feel depressed and we feel angry. So if we think about our kids who have so little agency often, um, not our kids, of course, but uh, kids in general, often have um, so little agency in their lives. So imagine what it feels like to be that helpless, that depressed, that angry, both about life and the lack of control they have in their lives, but also um, about their education, because that is the place where much of their lives is lived and 
when they don't have any power over it, it's really challenging. But then also, on the other hand, think about the time um, and how you felt when you claimed your agency, when you had um, power. And for most people, when they, when they claim their energy um, or they claim their agency, they feel energy. Uh, they feel powerful. They feel energetic. They feel inspired. And when we think about our kids, this is what we're hoping for. We're hoping for powerful, energetic, inspired kids, both um, in their daily lives, but also in their education. So um, in the book, um, The Self-Driven Child, which if you haven't read, you should read because it's awesome. Um, the authors write, agency may be one of the most important factors in human happiness and well-being. We all like to feel that we are in charge of our own destiny. So you can see here that, um, you know, in our personal lives, in the way we live our lives, agency and that ability to control our lives is very, very important. Um, and then moving on to education, um, Philip Williams wrote an article about student agency. And in that article, he wrote, Nothing engages and motivates students more deeply than enabling them to become the active agents in the process of learning. So when we think about how we felt when our agency was taken away, and then when we claimed our agency, and then we have that and let that inform the way we work with our children in their education, um, obviously we want to create um, kids that are powerful rather than helpless, energetic um, rather than depressed, and inspired rather than angry. So creating um, a space for them to have agency is really important. Finally, um, so agency affects us on a personal level, it affects us on an educational level, but the thing that I find really important for my own kids, um, both biological and students, um, is I want them to know that they have power over their world, that they can affect their world, that they can help people, that they can make the world a better place. So uh, Kristen Renwick Monroe was a researcher who was looking at um, the people who lived during uh, World War II in Nazi Germany. And she was comparing people who were um, Nazi sympathizers or even just bystanders and comparing them to people who um, helped the disenfranchised, helped people who were in danger. And she was trying to find out what made the difference. And she was planning to study altruism. That's what she um, thought her paper would be on. But what she found was that the difference, the thing that made the difference between people who were bystanders who said, I have no control over this, and people who um, reach forward to help others was agency. So she um, writes here, rescuers of, um, she calls them rescuers, but rescuers um, of victims in Nazi Germany have a strong sense of agency. Bystanders see themselves as people who are weak on agency with little control over their lives and little they can do to affect outside events. So this really spoke to me because one of the things that I really want for my children is the ability um, to affect their world and that for them to know that they, they have the power to do that. And agency is a wonderful way to do that. So homeschooling is the perfect opportunity to guide your kids um, and, and teach them and give them the opportunities to practice agency, to make their, um, their power over their learning journey more, more strong and, and thorough. Um, you can give your kids the freedom to design and follow their own path. So we all have different ideas about homeschooling. We all have different philosophies about homeschooling. So that freedom might be just one small piece of what they do, or it may be um, an entire learning journey that they're, um, they're creating on their own. But homeschooling in general is a wonderful way to work on that. So one of the challenges, though, is that um, students need um, to learn skills in order to have agency for themselves. 
So we often think, oh, if we just give kids time and say, okay, do what you want, they'll be successful and, and follow their dreams. But it, it, it isn't just time, though that is important, but it's also some really challenging skills, um, skills of self-awareness, skills of voice, and skills of enactment. So self-awareness, um, this is students knowing and being aware of themselves and knowing enough about themselves to know first what they want. So we would think, oh, of course they know what they want, that's silly. Um, that said, um, how many times have we asked kids, what do you want? I don't know, you know? So, so figuring out what you want, what you care about, what you're passionate about is actually can be a very challenging skill. The other part of self-awareness is knowing whether the students are effective in making their learning happen. So are they, you know, they may say, oh yeah, I know what I want, I'm, I'm fine, I got it. Um, but then do they actually follow through um, and do they actually learn the things that they, they really want to learn? And that, even knowing whether that's happening or not can be um, very challenging for kids. The second skill is voice. Um, and there are two levels of voice. One, um, students need to be able to voice what they want to learn. And this is very similar in some ways to self-awareness. However, um, if a student can't say what they want to learn, is it because they don't know what they want to learn? Or is it because they're unable to convey what they want to learn? Perhaps they're unable to convey it because they don't have the words and the languaging to um, explain what they want to learn. Or maybe it's because they're shy and insecure and don't have the confidence to do that. So being aware of um, developing that kind of voice is important. The other side of voice is using the skills both of speaking and listening to work with mentors or to work with a group. Now, occasionally a student just wants to learn by themselves and they can learn by themselves and everything they need to know they can get um, individually, but often they need to find a mentor to help them, um, help teach them a skill or they want to work with a group of people because there are definitely benefits there. So do they have the voice, including speaking and listening skills to work with others? And finally, the skill of enactment is very important in um, student agency. So students need to learn how to make their, lap, uh, their learning happen. And this is actually incredibly challenging. So it requires planning, it requires initiative, it, uh, it requires courage, and even adults have a hard time with um, making things happen. But if we expect our kids to uh, graduate from high school and either go to college or go work in the workplace, they will be expected to make their learning happen or to make their projects happen um, and yet, we can't just throw them into that position when they get older. We need to let them practice, let them learn the important skills and let them practice now when they're younger so that they can be successful uh, when they get older in those situations. So I did um, research with uh, kids both in the program where I teach, which is kindergarten through eighth grade, as well as high school students. Um, to learn about agency, to teach them um, the skills necessary for agency. And one of the things I wanted to know is where they were at and what skills they needed to develop. So if you look at this um, uh, rubric here, on the left column, there are, it's a, it says self-awareness, do I know what I wanna learn? Do I know if I'm effective? There's voice, can I convey my needs and wishes, and can I use my voice effectively, for example, with groups or mentors, and enactment, can I make my learning happen, can I access support or, and resources. So in this rubric, it begin, for each of these skills, there's a beginning um, uh, example and beginning skills, progressing, skilled, and advanced. So for example, for the self-awareness, 
beginning would be, I have trouble thinking of what I want to learn on my own, but when people suggest ideas, I can learn topics that I find interesting, or I can find topic, learning topics that I find interesting. When they progress, I can make a list of things I like to, whoop, sorry about that. Um, I can make a list of things I like to learn about on my own. Um, when they are skilled, I know what I like to learn about, and I have some ideas um, about how to make this happen in ways that work for me and my learning style. And in, in the advanced category, I know what I like to learn about and the educational path that calls me. And I know the steps to take in order to get there. So for each of these, you can see how things develop um, in terms of voice and being able to work in groups. Um, beginning, sometimes I'm able to join a group to learn. Um, progressing, I'm usually able to. Um, skilled, they start to be able to create their own group. Sometimes I can use my voice to enlist others' help or to join and create a community for learning. And then advanced, I can effectively enlist mentors, support, and a community. So during the research, what, the way that I used this was I um, filled this out at the beginning and then at the end to find out how kids progress with the um, the teaching about the agency skills that we were working on. So obviously it's going to be very different to fill this out with a kindergartner than it is to uh, fill this out with a senior. So by the time the kids are older, they can fill it out. And it's a really wonderful way for them to, to consider to have that metacognition, that awareness of their thinking, um, and to say, what am I good at and what do I need to work on? When I did this with the younger kids, uh, the parents filled it out, so that, and it was really helpful for the parents to fill it out about their children so that they had ideas about where their kids were and what their kids needed to work on. Um, and then some of the kids I just interviewed. So I would interview um, the kids and ask them these kinds of questions in different language and language that was appropriate for their age level. So what I did when I did this um, with my class is I did it at the beginning and the end. And then for each child, I filled it out. Um, their parents filled it out and the kids were interviewed to fill it out. And I also had an outside observer. So I had a lot of people giving feedback. Um, and then this is very quickly. <laughs> I know it's, um, you know, academic -y, but um, you can see here. So the blue lines were the baseline. Um, uh, uh, agency skills, so filling out that rubric at the very beginning, how they did, and then the red was at the end after we had been working on our agency skills over several months, um, I filled out the rubrics again and had other people do their part. Um, and you can see that everybody, even the kids for whom agency is really challenging, um, improved at least some. So agency is something that we can work on and improve over time. So one of the things that's important is to have tools for building agency. So this link here is to our Learning Journeys Forum website, and, uh, and then it leads to a student agency website. Um, so um, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, and then I'm going to open it up again. All right. Um, because I want you to see what is available on these websites um, so that you can see what the possibilities are because there is a lot out there. Um, so this is the student agency website and if you go down and the reason I'm showing you this is because there's a lot of possibilities and a lot of tools that you can use in working with your own kids. So for example, down here it has, you know, what is it? Why is it important? How it, can we create it? Those are things we've talked about a little bit. Um, but if you go up here at the top, the methods give some different methods for working on the different skills. So for example, um, for each um, topic, for each skill that we have, self-awareness, voice, and enactment, you can click on the link and it has um, some possibilities of things that they can do. So you can go there to see what are, some, what are some things that would be helpful. And also asking questions and contemplating answers. One of the things that I found for kids that improved their agency the most 
was really just talking about it and thinking about it and being very aware um, of their the choices they were making and why they were making those choices. So that is something that is really helpful. Um, and then in the resources section, there are two things that I have created and both are available for free, down, uh, free PDF downloads. So you can um, download them for free. Um, so over on the left is a student agency improvers guide. And what this has is it's got an instructions booklet for how to use it. It's got journals for the parent or teach and or teacher, um, the teen kids. It has topic and method cards. And these are for those kids who, when you say, uh, what would you like to do today? And they say, uh, um, these are just lists of things that they can go through and find. So I had one student who for the life of her had no idea what she wanted to do. But when she was had cards to look at, she could go through and say, yes, no, no. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. So they're, they're very helpful in that way. And then there's also a copy of the student rubric that um, I gave you before. And then on this side, um, these are the student agency curiosity questions. So um, it is in its complete form of, of a booklet, <laughs> but um, the, there's a PDF download. So you can get all the information. It's not as pretty, but it works. Um, and what this basically has is it has a little bit of a description of uh, the different skills of student agency. And, and then it has lists of curiosity questions to encourage self-awareness, voice enactment. And then it has, um, again, another copy of the student agency rubric. But um, this is a way to encourage those conversations. So if a kid seems really stuck with their uh, voice, if they're screaming, they clearly know what they need or know what they want, but they can't for the life of them say it um, in the voice section, it gives you some ideas. Of, these are some questions you could ask um, to work with your child. And then finally, if you are gung-ho and ready to go, here is um, some of my research. So this first one was uh, is basically my master's thesis. So it's a little bit dense, but at the end in the appendix, it has um, all of the kind of worksheets and rubrics and um, questions and things that I did with my students to help uh, teach student agency. So if you skip, skim through the dense parts, you can get to some, there's some good information there. Um, there's an article on honoring, honoring student voice um, and how we can really work to honor student voice. And then another one just on the learning journey that I have taken with my colleagues there um, to, uh, to come to the program to create Learning Journeys Forum and then also the, the program where we work in San Diego, California. So uh, thank you so very much for joining me for this. I really hope that the conversation will continue either in the comments below or always feel free to reach out on our website to communicate. Um, we have a Facebook page and um, email, you know, if you have any questions, because there's so much wisdom in the homeschooling community. Um, and I, I would love, that's why we created the forum, as, is as a place for people to share their ideas and to share their knowledge. So um, I look forward to hearing from you and wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right, don't quite want to run away yet. We have uh, one more talk because we were a little bit behind. It's uh, it's tech tools for or technology, yeah, technology tools for students with learning differences from Lexio Learners again. And then we're going to close off with some closing remarks and some reminders about some of the giveaways and things like that. So stay on for just a little bit longer, and we'll get some goodies for you too.
Hello, thank you for joining me for the Technology for Students Who Learn Differently talk. We are for particularly focusing on students with dyslexia. My name is Jess Arce, AKA Coach Jess. My mom was diagnosed with dyslexia in the 1940s at the University of Yale. Back then, most people had no clue what dyslexia was, but she knew she was dyslexic. However, she um, didn't know what dyslexia was or looked like in other people. I, as a kid, was diagnosed as having a reading disability, or not diagnosed, but labeled uh, as a kid. And I didn't learn to read until I was held back in third grade and retook the grade. And then I got skipped to the right grade um, the next year when I changed schools. And because my math, skill, math skills were ahead of grade level, so I was able to transition in now that I could read. Um, and then I didn't realize until years later, and after we had four children, that my husband was also dyslexic. He um, has more severe dyslexia than I do, and he had a different experience, and it's more your typical dyslexic experience where he was accused of being lazy, and he would goof around to cover up his dyslexia. Um, so we got married, didn't know either of us were dyslexic, and then we had four children, and three of our four children were diagnosed as dyslexic. And so, um, well, actually two of our four children were diagnosed as dyslexic. One of our children was not, he has moderate to mild dyslexia, but he has profound dysgraphia, which he has, which means difficulty with writing. So he can't take his thoughts from his mind and put it on paper. That is different than dys dyslexia. Um, and it's not as common as dyslexia is. And um, so I, in 2011, started helping my own kids, my two uh, profound and severe dyslexic kids, and then other families asked me to help their kids who were in the homeschool community, and so that's when my business began in Las Vegas, and then we moved to California, and um, I actually was pursuing my real estate career, which I had done um, in Las Vegas and Texas before becoming dyslexia tutor in Las Vegas. So I um, then um, so then over the years I Dyslexia became my passion, and I just focused on helping other families with dyslexia. So today we're going to talk about technology and um, text to speech is one of the most common types of technology for dyslexic students. And this technology uh, takes texts and reads them out loud on the computer, just like on a cell phone would do. And um, so you can find programs like OneNote and Word and use this text to speech. And then the opposite of that is speech to text. And the speech to text application, it, it takes spoken words and makes them into printed text. So you can, like on your telephone, you can say something and then it'll just um, appear there for you. And it's becoming more and more commonplace as techn technology evolves. Another option is word prediction, predictions. So um, you can start typing in a sentence and it'll 
give you some ideas. Sometimes just suffixes. Sometimes they'll give you whole word ideas. Uh, Google is a great platform to find virtually everything you're looking for. Google has, and if they don't have it yet, they will soon have it. They have so many options available. I don't know that Google Hangout is one of the top places. Um, I've actually been using Zoom for three years, so long before most people knew it existed. I was tutoring my students on Zoom because Skype was always dropping and Hangouts, I could, most people didn't have Hangouts and it just wasn't a practical program. But, um, most of their other options are great. Google Docs are great, and Google Sheets. This program was created on a Google Sheet uh, as long. Um, and so there's lots of resources on Google. Sometimes I use Google, Google Translate. I will copy and paste uh, something I'm, I wanna read um, into Google Translate and then press English on both sides and then it'll just read it out loud to me. So that's a nice quick way to just listen to something. So audiobooks. Audiobooks are a great resource. I highly recommend that you use an audiobook along with the actual book for, with the student or yourself. It is a great way to reinforce the information because you're seeing it. So you're learning how to spell the words. You're getting familiar with the word. If you ever see the word in the future, it will be a familiar to you because you're also hearing it. You can speed up audiobooks these days. So it's, it's really a great option if you're on the bus or if you're um, at the gym, you can listen to an audiobook. You get much better quality vocabulary through listening to books than movies or plays or talking to people because the quality of writing is very different than the other types of writing that we are usually um, exposed to. So definitely keep that in mind if you don't have the book or don't have time to read the book while you're listening to it don't worry about it that's just you know ideal and preferred but it's not your only option by all means whoops okay so there are so many free options available these days um i think nine no eight of the nine Listed here are free, I think Audible, no, seven of the eight. Audible and Learning Ally both cost money. Audible, um, anyone can buy a monthly subscription. Learning Ally, you need to send a letter stating that your child has dyslexia and it's a membership fee, an annual membership fee. The library has free resources. Voice Dreamer is free, Book Shares, Read and Go, at least at the time of this recording, all of these were free. Project Glutenberg um, is, I believe every book is over 100 years old and they are all free. Live, well, lit, sorry, Libby Vox, Lit Go, to, Lit To Go, sorry, here's my dyslexia. Story Nori, all of those are free options at the time of this publication. So. There, there's a lot of uh, audiobook resources available these days. And um, dyslexic friendly fonts can be really uh, desirable for people with dyslexia and learning differences to have it be visually discriminated. This is a website uh, that belongs to um, a company that's part of a dyslexic entrepreneur group that I'm part of, and they have created reading tools for dyslexics that improve reading skills in an enjoyable way. So that, um, they I think are gonna provide more resources in the future, they're a startup company. So that's another option. So thank you for joining us today. Um, you know,
technology is constantly changing these days and there are so many new technological options continually becoming available. So you just got to keep Googling it, checking it, see what you can find. Um, some things will work for some students and totally not work for others and they could both be dyslexic. So don't let that bother you. Technology is a great option and there are, it can make our lives so much easier now. Today we don't have to hand write as much as we used to. Uh, I dictate into my phone or my um, Lexa and my shopping list. I, my kids put it on there as well. So there's so many different options available these days. It's wonderful. And um, it also is nice to do things that are just hands on and get our hands dirty and have fun because Dyslexic people are usually very multi-sensory. They want to feel things, but you also have to be careful about um, Some people can be very sensitive about what textiles textures they are feeling so just um, Bear that in mind Thank you for joining us today. And if you have any questions or want to make any um, Schedule a private call we can do so. If you go to bit.ly forward slash Lexia Learners, A-P-P-T, that's the best way to schedule an appointment with me and we can have a private conversation. Or you can go to my website and learn more about our company. We provide tutoring for students and we are going to be offering um, classes in reading, writing, spelling, math, science, art in the future in our Tustin location and virtually. We are able to do both virtually. So at this time during the corona virus or any other time, we can service you online. And it's almost the same as being in person. Well, now everyone knows what Zoom is. I used to have to explain to people, but we, um, we screen share and our students use our computer. So um, that's a great, technology resource that uh, is available to people all over the country and um, so I think people are going to be more comfortable using online services moving forward so that'll be an exciting new transition thank you and everyone stay safe bye All right. You guys can see my pillows. <laughs> awesome. Well, we had a phenomenal day. We had one or two small hiccups, but I think that we've got a, a nice groove going so far. So that's pretty good for the first time doing this kind of uh, extended streaming event and I am so glad to have all of our viewers so I have everyone commenting and posting on Instagram and, and Facebook and it's just been wonderful having you all here I know you guys are hungry I know I'm hungry and we're not too far we did catch up about 15 minutes we were a half hour behind but now we're doing better I did want to point out a couple little things to remind everyone before we go off here and the first thing I want to do is highlight a couple of the giveaways that we're still doing that you guys can still are eligible for. So we have our free tutoring lesson both on Facebook and Instagram from American Academy of Strategic Education. All you have to do is find that post that I'm asking you what subject do you or have you in the past had difficulty with or for your kids what subject they have difficulty with. Uh, and comment, answer the question and you will be eligible to win a free tutoring session. We also had the lesson today from Game School, Homeschool by Meg. And because we all love games and I love games, all you have to do is to post a picture of your favorite game or your favorite game that you own currently on either Instagram or Facebook. Just make sure that you hashtag DCH2020 so we can find it. Hashtag DCH2020 
with a picture of your favorite currently owned game and you'll be eligible to win a free money games kit from right start math i know we talked about that they uh, showed a little bit about that yesterday so it's so much fun and money munch kids carries it i love it a lot of parents really enjoy the math games and so we want to make sure that you get a chance to enjoy them too because we know how much you like games so on top of that we also are going to have a historical conquest and crafty school crates uh, giveaway as well and that all of that information is going to be in a graphic look for it on the Facebook page and on money munch kids Instagram page we'll post it up today uh, probably before 8 o'clock so you guys will be able to do it do it and you'll be able to win it and so long as you're posting by the end of the conference tomorrow at 6 p.m you will be eligible to win and what you're going to do is you're going to take a picture of a coin or a bill just make sure you're getting the president and the person that's on it that's all we need just the person's face obviously that's going to change depending on whether or not you're using a coin or a bill and the other thing you have to do as always is hashtag dch2020 or we won't be able to find your your ta your, your post so make sure that you do that it's just a picture of the the person on a coin or a bill doesn't matter if it's US or not if you want to do something fun you have an international coin have at ye just make sure you hashtag DCH 2020 okay and you'll be able to win either a six-month membership to hunt the or an American symbols history box from crafty school crates finally I want to remind you guys that we are doing our TikTok live tomorrow on zoom so practice that TikTok. And uh, make sure you have your fruit, uh, fruit by the foot ready. Uh, and uh, we also ha still have time for the engineering challenge by Tinker the Robot. Make sure you post your child's engineering challenge picture by 10 p.m. tonight so we can have time to look through it and find the winner tomorrow, okay? The winner is going to be announced tomorrow, and they're going to be getting a box from Tinker the Robot. So make sure that you post, and as always, tag Tinker the Robot and hashtag DCH2020. Always use that hashtag so we can find you guys, okay? I want to say thank you all for being here today and a big thank you also to our sponsors and our vendors and all of our presenters for creating such great talks and presentations for you guys. It's been very informative. I've had a lot of fun getting to see all of the, these amazing presentations. And uh, I want to say thank you again to our sponsors and vendors for today. That was Tinker the Robot. WM Tutor, American Academy, teaching kids to buy stocks. JJ was on the live stream chat for a while. I think he might still be on. Uh, Celebration Education, Carrier Shell Curriculum, Bon Voyage, Lexia Learners. You just heard from Jess from Lexia Learners a couple of minutes ago. And again, Crafty School Crates, who has also donated a wonderful prize for the historical person on the coin or bill uh, giveaway that we're doing as well. And again, the graphic for all those giveaways and all the stuff is going to be going up uh, just in an hour or two on the Instagram for Money Munch Kids and the Facebook group for Money Munch Kids. Well, the Facebook page for Money Munch Kids and the Facebook group for DCH. So you will be able to find it. Awesome. I do want to make sure that I highlight a couple of really cool stuff that's coming tomorrow here. Tomorrow, again, we're doing those live TikToks and the design challenge. I'm also going to be doing the create.